Hey, it's Jeff from Home Renovision, and today's video, we are renovating this entire basement from A to Z. That's right, from start, like this, to finish, we're gonna show you how. This is 1,400 square feet of finished space with sound control measures in the ceiling, insulated subfloor system with an engineered hardwood floor, and we're gonna tell you how much we paid for this to get this done DIY at the end of the show. Hey guys, Jeff here. So if you're doing a renovation, you've got an incredible opportunity to manage the sound transfer from one space to the next. Specifically managing the impact noise of people walking or using shoes or the dogs running around. We're also gonna cover how to manage the sound transfer from a common area into a bedroom. Everybody wants an office space for a private bedroom nowadays. So if you're doing renovations, this information will be key. Remember, it's not always soundproofing, but there are different levels of sound management. We're gonna deal with the first one, which is just managing the room. And the second one is managing privacy. All right, now for doing this, we're gonna use fiberglass pig. Next gen. I know there's a lot of people out there, oh, we, you should be using rock soil or mineral wool. And I'm like, yeah, there's lots of people out there that have been paid a lot of money to have that opinion. But here on this channel, I give you my honest opinion. At the end of the day, the difference in sound transmission when you're using this kind of insulation or the mineral wool is almost identical. It's not worth the investment, especially when you're just managing sound. So in this ceiling, we're just managing it and pink insulation installs a lot faster than the rock does. So that's what I'm gonna use. Even though it's next gen, still recommend. Get something to cover you up. I'm gonna be putting in both four or 500 bats in this basement today. We're gonna to throw it all on time-lapse and then we'll talk a little bit about the benefit on how the soundproofing actually works. And we'll show you how to go from just managing a little bit of impact noise to actually creating a sound barrier between the bedroom and the hallway. And then I'll start underneath the ducting here, extend it out both sides. As you can see, when I'm insulating, I'm not trying to fill the entire cavity with material because we're not going for that dramatic of an effect. We're just trying to reduce noise impact. So one layer of insulation is enough. Yes, you can always say there'll be people that want to go two layers. Oh, we'll stuff it full. I don't care if I can get three, I'll go three. Listen, it's your budget. You do what you want. But on this project, we're just trying to be reasonable and practical. And when we get to the ducting, sometimes the ducts are low in the cavity and sometimes they're high. So I'll go above and beneath. And if I have an opportunity with the ducts when they're really low, I'm going to feed insulation there I'll peel the bat apart and get like an R10 and I'll install that when I'm doing the strapping and that video is coming in the next part of the series when it comes to your plumbing again same with the ducting we want to try to get the insulation on the interior of the room for the plumbing as well we don't want to have people flushing a toilet and having that sound of the water rushing above your head while you're sitting there trying to enjoy a conversation because we're just getting mass in the ceiling this is not about perfection it's about getting the mass in the ceiling now I'm intentionally trying to leave a little room above the joist because I know over time that bat is all going to fall down but I have an electrician who's going to come in and run pot lights after the fact so he's going to need that little extra space to go feed that wire across the ceiling so that's why I'm trying to leave it a little bit higher and you can see some of those air gaps and I understand but again this is not about perfection it's about putting mass in the ceiling to eat as much sound as possible and that is all we're going to take care of here all right so I'm just going to take a quick break remember when you're working on a ladder near a ceiling you are creating a thermal barrier as well and so you get the effect of it right it's hot I'm going to just come back after I grab a quick lunch and I'm gonna insulate this wall and soundproof it so that you get the transfer. Sound management, number one is you wanna manage sound to pass them from floor to floor. We can do that here just by insulating it and putting a finished ceiling on. Number two is how to create more privacy. So someone can be doing something in one room making noise and someone can be over here doing something making noise and it doesn't affect each other. That is the next level of sound management. We're gonna call that the beginning of soundproofing technology. And of course, the third level is to really soundproof something. That's gonna be in the theater video. Now we're gonna come over to the wall and we're gonna up the game because now we're not just doing a little bit of sound mitigation we're trying to have a little bit more control over the atmosphere so here we're going to be a lot more particular about how we're installing our insulation and a lot more particular about how we're going to finish off our sauna pan board very important to note when you're building your own walls, when you're considering using insulation, whether it's for thermal or for sound control, remember the insulation bats come pre-cut to be exactly snug when you build 16 inch on center studs. When we're installing the bat, basically they come in four foot sections. We're down in the south, they come in eight foot roll. And so you have the same effect from the bottom of the top plate in this house particular is eight feet to the underside of the steel. So this works really well. When I come across electrical wires, what we're doing is we're just cutting the shape of that wire run on the back side of the insulation and then eating it like a Pac-Man. <laughs> All right, and then just eat it and roll it back up into the bat. And you can do that as many times as necessary to achieve the desired result. When it comes down to the plugs, because I'm using an R20 and we are trying to create as much mass as possible, I'm cutting away the shape of the plug from the back side of the insulation to allow room for it to be installed and still have insulation wrapping in behind. You'll note that when we go to the theater room, we take the next step going above and beyond that and we use putty pads. But in this application, this is plenty strong enough. 
Now you'll notice one spot here, the electrician didn't get the wire run. That's fine, he's coming back in a couple of days for he's got three little touch-ups. We're gonna leave the installation out of that panel and not close the backside until it has a chance to be finished and inspected. Once we get the installation all, now we're time for the sauna pan panel. That panel is three quarter inch thick and we're installing with a one and five eighths drywall screw. You can get drywall screws up to three and a half inches. Not at the regular building store, but if you go to the specialty supply stores, they have the drywall screw in increments of a half inch and quarter and three eighths. Remember your screw shouldn't be any longer than one inch of actual screw inside the stud itself. That way you're gonna protect all the wires running through there from being accidentally pierced. Sauna pan does not need to be installed with 100 screws. You can just pin the corners, mark your studs, and then you can chalk line later, okay, from the top to bottom so you know where your drywall screws go on. That's gonna be the system here. Just pin it, and then when the drywall goes on, you're gonna use five screws for every four foot length, and that'll solve all your problems. And again, this is a very quick installation that gives you incredible sound control. And don't forget, sauna pan eats sound. It is the best solution on the market I've found today. Well, there we go. That's enough of the physical demonstration. Let's talk about the system and issues you're gonna have to deal with as a result. One, this is a exterior mass panel, which is really what it is, okay? I'm gonna encourage all of our viewers in the United States, reach out to the Home Depot, your Lowe's, your Menards, your Ace Hardware's, and say, hey, when are you guys gonna start carrying this product? It comes from Canada. There's nothing about this product that keeps it from coming across the border if it's available in very limited locations in the States right now. This is a lot easier to work with than mass vinyl, all right? It's a one-man operation. If you remember, I did the mass vinyl in my farm. My son and I just died installing that stuff. So profile details. This is the electrical box. It's installed at regular depth. It's designed to be flush with the finished drywall. This panel is thicker than regular drywall. So take a look here, three quarters, okay? That means we're gonna have a three quarter of an inch thicker wall. And because I'm soundproof, I'm gonna add five eighths drywall detail to this. Once we get everything finished with the drywall, we'll come back Back, there's what is called a box extender. It's like a just a square that screws into the existing, it has new location holes to receive the next receptacle, and that's fine. At that point, we'll take out spray foam and we'll inject all the way around to make it sure we have a perfect air seal as well. Now, and on the door, of course, means we're not gonna have a traditional door jam. We could have just gone with a two by four door jam, hinges on the inside, door swings open, everything's fine. Whenever you're adding a product like this, you wanna install the panel, not on the hinge side. Okay, remember, you wanna leave your hinges available to be screwed into the wood. It's nice to have that option, right? You don't want your hinges floating out there on the jam only. So we're gonna cut this all back to fit the size of the hole. I'm gonna be ordering a jam for this that's made for a two by six wall instead. And then I'll run that through my table saw and cut it down to the right thickness from the front. That'll give us the finish we need. Yes, it's a couple extra details, but making sure that a room is really isolated from everything outside the room can be a massive benefit, whether it's a nursery or an office or just giving your kids some privacy so they can grow up online. It's a great idea. Now, that's it. We'll finish off the rest of this. So here's the thing. When you're doing sound management, You've got to manage not just transmission, you've got to manage the sound of rushing water. This is a three inch ABS pipe, which is a drain for toilets and tubs and showers, laundry machines. And if you're sitting down here in a finished room and you haven't insulated this pipe, you're not going to have sound protection and you're going to hear the running water. While you're strapping your ceiling, which you always, always do, you want to realize that insulation works very effectively for thermal when it's expanded because it's trapping air pockets. And when you compress it, you lose R value. But we're doing sound transmission and we're looking for mass. And when you compress this, it has the same effect as when it's expanded. So it's okay, I put in your strap and then you can feed this in. There wasn't enough space previously to make this stay up here, right? Like I can't put that bat in and expect it to be there overnight. In a lot of cases, when you're really close, you gotta force this in, all right? There we go. That is mass, and that will stop the sound from transmitting, and that makes your room habitable. Remember, vertical or horizontal, it's the same issue. When your walls are open, take the opportunity to make it as perfect as you can. You can never go backwards in time and do it easy. If you're sitting there in your living room and you hear the toilet flush, you'll know your house is built by somebody who's doing minimum code and didn't really care about the end result. First of all, people ask me all the time in the videos, Jeff, why do you add strapping to the ceiling? And here's the reason why. If you take a look at this basement, for instance, I have a 19 foot span. With this particular floor joist, because it's engineered and it is exactly 16 inch on center, you would be tempted to just put the drywall up and, you know, and join on the seam and everything should be fine. But the reality is, in today's world, we're gonna have an intricate lighting design. We're gonna be using a lot of these slimline LED pot lights. What we wanna do is by adding strapping, it gives us the ability to have the electricians chase from one light across the ceiling and from this cavity to the next cavity without having to damage the ceiling, drill holes down the road. Gives you a lot of flexibility as a homeowner too with making modifications. You finish your basement one year and then another year, hey honey, let's get an overhead projector and a sound system. If you've got a strap ceiling, you can fish wire from all your potholes 
not have to damage everything. That reduces your cost of work, right? That's a good benefit. Second benefit. Let's look up here. Every time somebody steps on this floor joist, that's spanning 20 feet. And if you put strapping on it and you nail it, every time they step on this floor joist, load transfers from here to here and from here to here. That means your floor is now three times as strong. Now upstairs, they've got engineered hardwood nailed in place. What that means is if this is your floor and every time you walk on it, it deflects, all of that nail is getting a lot of stress on it. And it starts to pull apart over time from the hardwood and the OSB subfloor. And that's where squeaks come from. Now it's not gonna happen in the first week, but it is gonna happen in the first couple of years. By the time you get 20 years in on a brand new build, you're not ready to throw in brand new floors yet, but if it's all squeaky because of deflection, you're gonna be tempted to go and spend more money where it wasn't necessary. Add strapping, stretch out your deflection from all of the foot traffic and extend the life of your flooring. The third reason I always strap is this. Not everywhere you're gonna get engineered floor joists and not everywhere they're gonna be perfectly centered. A lot of times mechanical chases and everything else in the design and the way they lay out the house, the joists are on different locations. They're two inches apart or six inches. And so then the drywall would never land in the right spot. By strapping, you go install all your drywall opposite direction. When you're standing here looking at a ceiling, it's easy to see where the screws go because you can see the strap on each side. That makes your life easy. And when if you've got an easy situation to install your drywall, that makes installing drywall a lot more fun. Now here it is kids, this simple 16 inch on center, which means from this side of the wood to this side of the wood needs to be 16 inches. So go ahead and measure and cut it. Perfect every time. Keep a spare piece of wood on you as a spacer block and get staples. Now I am using 12 foot long strapping here. If that's too long for you to manage, get the eights. But you know, the longer the wood, the more economical it is. I'm gonna push this board down until it hits my wall. I'm gonna line this up on my little mark. Done. Take my spacing block. Square it off. Done. Ah. <laughs> that reminds me, Max, remember? We did that one video and we were like, Gordon Ramsay making a burger. Strapping. On. Nail. In. <laughs> All right, that's it. That's the whole system. Now, I don't want you to run away yet because I got a couple more secrets for you. And here they are. When you're joining two pieces of strapping together, because these things are warped, they may not line up. All you do is go butt end to butt end on the strapping. And if they're not lined up, it doesn't matter. Then you come back with a few of these, go over top, nail through from the other side, and then make sure you're nice and flush. That'll keep your drywall installation perfect. Another thing you're gonna wanna know, consider your layout for your lights. We're gonna have pot lights right down the middle and another run over here and the thirds, just a little bit off the heat run. I've already done the math, 16 on center, avoids all of my pot lights, which means I don't have to drill holes through the strapping later. So I think about the end from the beginning. It's okay to use more wood than you need. Like you can go 16, 16, 12, and then 16 again, again, and again. Remember the drywall is going the opposite direction. So just consider where your butt joints are gonna be. Measure your eight, 10, or 12 off the end. Make sure you got a strap where it goes. Avoid putting straps next to each other and having the drywall on the seam, because house move, that will crack. Make sure your drywall seams, if you're going butt joints, are in the middle of the strapping. Other than that, one other quick note. You can see over here, I'll use this as a pointer stick. My ducting is really close to the bottom. I could not get an insulation bat in there. What I'm gonna do when I get to that side of the room is I'm gonna take my bat, I'm gonna tear it in half, cause you can do that. Make it an R10, R12, okay? And then I'm gonna leave my strapping loose. And then when I get over there, I'm gonna pull it down, put that bat in, and then I'll nail it up. I wanna have a little bit of mass underneath those duct lines. And I wanna have a little bit of mass underneath this plumbing line, same reason help kill the sound transfer, all right? At the end of the day, there's one other reason you wanna use strapping, and that's this. I am building a bulkhead all around this room and putting lights in it. It's gonna be beautiful. Stay with us on the whole project. 24 inches out, comes to here. If I don't have strapping, I have nothing to tie this bulkhead into. But now that I've got my strapping run, I'm gonna be able to tie my ceiling into the strapping all the way along, and I've already got myself blocked up and ready to roll. This is a much safer way to do this instead of using your hand. There we go. Now she's locked together. Ho, 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 ho. <clears throat> All right. We'll just get this again. All right. The secret here is to laminate the joint together 
so that whatever you're installing on your ceiling isn't going to have an issue. Oh. Huh. If it splits apart on you, you can always force it back together and hit it again. There we go. Whew. Perfect every time. So let's just recap. Gives you flexibility for running electrical. It gives you more protection on your floor joists against deflection, which will extend the life of your flooring, especially if you have tile. Adding strapping almost eliminates the ability for the tile to crack because you kill a lot of deflection. It makes it very easy to install your drywall because you can stick your drywall up and you can see where the wood is and put a screw right next to it, right? It also gives you the flexibility to add that insulation in those hard to reach places where the bat isn't gonna stick there all by itself. At the end of the day, a couple hundred dollars of lumber, you can strap your whole basement and it provides you all that flexibility and protection for your investment. Once you put drywall on, you can't do anything behind the walls. So always consider the end from the beginning, give yourself flexibility, make your installation easier, protect your home and renovate like a pro. Challenge you're gonna find in almost every basement is you're gonna have plumbing like this or heat runs jumping a joist. You're gonna have areas where they've designed intentionally for you to have to make some sort of a box. We're gonna show you my system today for how to make the perfect straight bulk head, soffit, whatever you call it. We're gonna drop it, we're gonna move it over a little bit, make it two feet intentional and make it an architectural feature. So I'm gonna show you all my tips and tricks to get this done so it looks perfect when you're finished. The biggest challenge with making boxes that are really long is they have too much movement or they have too much corner bead joints that don't line up or you end up building below everything and everything gets really low. Today we're going to go tight to the steel. We're going to be able to put pot lights in here. It's going to make it look surgical. It's going to look like we built this with a 3D printer. Let's just jump into this. And I know it's crazy, but today I'm not even using a laser. <laughs> it's not necessary. What we are going to do, because we're dealing with steel and engineered floor joists, everything is already perfectly flat. We're just going to measure off with our tape. And we're going to measure off from the steel, not the wooden plate above the steel, because that'll come and go. And we're going to go to 24. I'm going to make my mark right here. Uh. And that's how you make a mark, make a V. Because the tip right here, that's the measurement. This is just to make that extra influence, all right? We're gonna come down here and do it again. And then I'm gonna just throw in a chalk line. And the chalk line is the secret to success here. Okay, we'll throw a chalk line up and then we'll install our soffit. We're gonna throw a screw right on the point. Ooh, lovely. I'm gonna show you my chalk line. That's the string that's the center. The key here is to put this over top of the screw head so it's resting right there on the middle. And that's part of the line. There we go. Go as far as you can. And then when you're done, you hold it with your fingers, okay? Create tension. Now we got tension. Now I wanna move the string around until this is right on that other tip. And then we pull and snap. Now I got a line. That is how you use a chalk line. It's a lot better than your cars that can go in, hey, Alex, good from here, right? Okay, now let's get our steel. The biggest secret of here is we're gonna use steel track. Wood is never straight. <laughs> like, never straight. So, we're gonna install steel track onto the ceiling, and that's as easy as using a drill and a couple of drywall screws. Hello. Alrighty. Now, uh, I wanna get right on my red line. There we go. And the reason I do that is that one little dent is all it takes so that my screw isn't running around when I'm trying to put it through. There, right, let's get on our line again. There we are. Okay, when you're building a box like this, we're not building structure. We don't have to carry a lot of weight. We only have to carry drywall. So one screw for every joist is plenty. We'll go all the way to the other end. And that'll make sure that the rest of this stays straight while I throw the screws in. Piece of cake. There we are. Hey. Okay, there we go, step one. That wasn't that hard. Step two is determine the height that we wanna to build to. So to do that, we're gonna take our tape measure and we're gonna go right up to the joist, but we're gonna go behind the pipe and measure from here. You can see that that number makes no sense whatsoever. <laughs> 13 sixteenths, that's just great. We'll see how consistent that is. Wow, 
Yeah, that's consistent. Nine and 13 sixteenths. Okay, so I'm gonna get another piece of the same track. I'm gonna take out my snips and I'm gonna cut a bunch. I'll just go nine and three quarters. That's fine, it's a little shorter. The reason for that is this. If I make this section here just a little shorter and I can make some adjustments and then put them together. It gives me a little flexibility because even steel isn't perfectly straight. When I sit here and I look down that whole 30 foot beam, I can see a little bit of movement. You'd think it's straight, but it isn't. Okay, I'm gonna work right here, Max. All right, so here we are, stud. Nine and 13 sixteenths, right? If you pay attention here, check out the depth of this. It's an inch and an eighth thick, which means at the bottom and the top, I've got over two inches of play. So I don't wanna be trying to cut metal perfect on all three sides with hand snips. I'm gonna cut it back at nine and a half, okay? I'm gonna just mark the outside, the inside, and the other side. And we'll try to make this as straight as we can. Measure this side, right? I'm gonna look and measure here and cut. Bend it, and then you cut it. That's about as close as you're gonna to get to perfect, all right? Boom, one down. Repeat, nine and a half. Only 57 more to go. <laughs> right? There we go. All right. Now this is the tool that's uh, the secret weapon. It's a crimper for steel studs. And you can see it just pushes the two metal together. And I'll just show you an action here. We set it in and I stick it over. It's like a nail punch. Done. It's like if this is it and you're putting one, a, a, like a claw through, it takes the metal and it tears it and it peels it in. And when the tool is gone, it's, it's still crimped up. There's an overlay. That's all that's going on. Because we're more concerned about the height than everything else. Oh, always put the tooth on the outside so you're crimping into the metal. All right. There we go. Done. There, stud attached. <laughs> this $20 tool replaces the need to hire someone to help you for the day. Okay, we'll do this over here. Now, here's the foundation for this. This is where it gets fun. Now, I got another track. Now remember, the, what I'm building here is a U-shape. goes all the way around the whole room. But I don't have to worry about where I'm intersecting because I can always cut it back later. This is to get started. All right. Here we go. And then we take this. Now I'm in a position where I can take my level and level it off and then crimp it together. Okay. Boom. All right. If it's not level, all we do is give it a little tap because this holds it, but it'll let it slide. And then when it's bang on the money, I'll take the crimper and I'll get it from this side. <laughs> all right. All right. Now that's not the final solution. We're gonna do is we're gonna add a few more studs in there, we'll actually screw it all together, and that'll give it the longevity to carry all the weight. This is a great way to line up all your studs and get everything level. Now the secret to using a screw to drive this together is I just put a little mark here. So that's where the edge of the stud is, okay? You wanna go right off the edge into the back, not the front, because the front will bend away from the tip before the screw can make a hole. If you go into that back part, that's where the meat of that stud is. There's nowhere for it to deflect. And it just drives right in, smooth as butter. Again, over here, the back side is on this side. Oh, there we are. All right, now we're set up. This is not a very big rise. And I understand that people's desire would be, well, if I'm gonna put a butt joint, for instance, on the drywall here, I want a piece of material there to put a screw on each side. No, for the love of God, no. Just use your head for a second and say to yourself, when you install drywall on a wall horizontally, you only have material and screws every 16 inches. So anytime you build a ladder less than 16 inches tall, there's no requirement to have anything on the joint. Just tape it, all right? You can pop these in. Remember, the only weight that you're carrying is the weight of the drywall. And as soon as you screw the drywall across the top of this, it carries itself. So we have nothing really to do here. 
This is already overkill. All we're gonna do here now is take the screws and the drill and pop a couple more in. Okay. The reason I'm using screws and not just a crimper is because I'm trying to go for perfection. And the crimper is great for giving you an extra pair of hands, but when it comes right down to it, anytime you make a mistake with a crimper, you can't go back and fix it because you put a hole through all the metal. Lining this up, that just makes it all that much stronger. All right, now let's get down to the other end here and we'll talk about how to join all this together. Now, because I wanted 24 inch off the backside, remember we're doing a cabinet and a TV wall here. We want to go about 16 inches and I am 16 and a half, not a problem. Remember we did the video and I told you why it's important to do your strapping and here's why. Okay, because now I've got somewhere to attach my wall. I can't put a ladder in between floor joists unless I have strapping. It's not like I have to now, oh, and now I have to figure out how to solve this problem. I've already created a new ceiling height by adding the strapping. This makes this incredibly fast. And I'm just gonna put another mark down here at 16 and a half. Okay, throw up my first track, and we're gonna do the same thing all over again. I'm gonna hang my track, I'm gonna build a ladder, and then this track down the bottom, I'm gonna have extend past the inside corner. That gives me an ability to take two pieces like this and like this, and then screw the backside and the bottom and top corners. That makes that all one bend. So there's no movement and then I'll avoid cracking. Okay guys, we're gonna tie our corner together here. Let's just first refresh our memory, our measurement out to here. 23 and a quarter from there. We're going 24 inches, right? So we wanna just bring that corner together. All right, there we go. Now I've got my intersection point. Remember, just because it's straight doesn't mean everything stays level and square. So always measure and mark. Now what we're gonna do here is I'm gonna cut down the side where my intersection point is. All right, and a good piece of meat here. And I'm gonna flatten this out. Okay, now I'm gonna insert it and then I'm gonna screw it. And that'll bond those two pieces together in the corner. Okay, remember. Keep your fingers out of the way. We'll use two screws in this corner just to be sure. Now, to finish that off, right, we can screw that corner. Now what I'm gonna do is to make this corner complete, I'm gonna tie this to top and bottom, tie this one to the bottom, and then tie these two together. Make sense? When that's bonded together now, my drywall is continuous. That is never gonna crack in that corner. Now, we're gonna just finish off the rest of this room, but first, let's jump to the other side of the beam and show you what we're gonna do over there to be able to complete this construction. So I'm just cutting the angle on it, coming up in here, up in here, up in here. I'm about to blow your mind. I'm gonna be pulling it off the wall just a little bit here, and I'll show you why. The wood on the sill is in further than the metal. So I'm just making sure that I'm gonna clear that. I'm gonna build another ladder right here. Now here's why. I have 24 inches to the far side of that steel to this edge of this steel. That's a pretty good span. But in truth, it's only 21 and a half inches. So when I'm installing my drywall, as long as I get the drywall on the inside of this piece and I put on a little bit of adhesive here and then I can screw it on here, I'm only spanning 25 inches. I have a rule when it comes to soffit boxes, anything more than 30 inches, you've got to add another support. And that can be tricky because it's hard to get all three pieces exactly level. But at least with this kind of a system, if you have an issue, I can drop this one on, I can throw my level across, I can set it right where I want it, throw in a clip or two and then add some screws. It all comes together right a little bit quick. Now, because we're on a 45, I'm gonna do that as well, give or take. One here. One here. Okay, another crimper. Get that nice and tall. Go right to the back end here. Oh, come on, you bugger. There we go. That makes it possible to set the screw. Okay. All right, here we go. Now we're gonna just come down to flush. Throw the clip on, hit the other side, do the same. Couple of screws and there we go. This is the easiest way to work, guys. Metal's a little different, but at the end of the day, couple of the right tools for the job, and it's just hand tools. Buy the right fastener. Something that does some self-driveling. These are actually called, yeah, I call them wafer screws, but uh, this place calls them pan framing screw. Hmm. The idea is if you go to the store and you want to get them to say, hey, I'm screwing steel track to steel stud, and they'll give you the right products. Maybe we'll even put a link in the video description for a link on Amazon. 
Ah, uh, to save you the hassle. You know what? That one is going to get a crimp. I can't get a screw back there. Let's get it flush. Perfect. Rinse and repeat. I mean, we have to do this about, what, 100 more times? <laughs> There's the rest of my day. Max is going to go home. In just a couple seconds, we'll catch up on the next day where we're doing the drywall work. Cheers. <laughs> Bonk head video? Uh, all right, so I'm going to show you a little system here for bulkheads. You're going to love it. We're just going to take some PL Premium. <laughs> this gun has not been used in a couple days. Put a bead on the bottom of your 2x2, two 2x3, by two, two by 2x4, two by 2x8, two by I don't care. <laughs> no dust. Squeeze it right onto the steel. Flush with the steel. There we go. Boom. That's called structure. You don't have to nail. Now, the next day you come back because you want to know, how am I going to put my drywall ceiling here and attach it to the steel? And the answer is, I'm not. I'm going to attach it to the wood. So I'm going to put in my wood flush with the steel. I'm screwing it to the block that's been setting the adhesive. Now I got a screw surface and I got structure. Perfect every time. My drywall needs to be 28 inches wide by however long deep I want to make it. But because I'm coming over here and then I'm changing direction on the ceiling, I'm going to have my drywall come to here. This will make my next measurement easy because I'll be able to measure from the outside to this point over four feet and then draw a line there and measure back. This is really of no consequence. It's not that big a deal. But if I stop anywhere else, the angle gets weird and I've got to add that angle on this piece of drywall. And that's silly. So we'll measure it here. And it's going to be, well, we're going to go 39 and three quarters. Whenever you have more than one number, start writing them down. Right where you work makes a lot of sense. What did I say, 28? Yep. All right, so by 28. Now, I'm also going to put the drywall up and slide it over past the pipe, just like this wall piece was done, right? So I'm going to go 11 and a half and 18 and a half. Now I got my numbers. I'm going to bring my drywall over here so I can see the numbers while I measure and cut. Just double check before we go. Here we go. 11 and a half, 18 and a half. I'm a little aggressive. That's fine. That's my height. That gets inverted that way. Sometimes you just got to think through twice, right? All right. Let's cut this. As a rule when you're doing drywall, you want to try to get your taper joints to meet your taper joints and all that kind of jazz, right? But if you're doing a U-shaped box, it's impossible. Unless you want the whole side of your box to be all butt joints. That'll drive you nuts too. So what I like to do is find somewhere inconspicuous, like in a corner where there's gonna be lots of mud and I can make a transition from a taper joint, which is right here, to the butt joint, okay? There we go. One, like a glove box. There we are. Do I even know where the wood is? I think I got wood here. I know I got wood here. I just put it there. Okay. All right. We got the metal. All right. You'll notice that whenever you're putting a drywall screw into metal, it always wants to separate. Okay. That's normal. Don't let it bother you. There we go. So here's my ugly joint. This is a full half inch and then tapered. So. I'm gonna mark it, and when I'm doing all my taping, I'm gonna remember to do a fill coat here first, and then I'll do the rest of the room, and then I'll come back and I'll hit that with the paper tape later. Not a big deal. It's just a little bit of a fill. The only thing left for me to do now is I wanna stick a piece on the soffit face real quick because I wanted to go show you my secret for taping these boxes. You don't use metal corner bead. You don't use paper with metal. This is a 30 foot run. I don't wanna have any of those joints. Whenever you put two pieces of corner bead together, they're never lined up right because it's subject to change with all the different contours of the drywall, all the little details, okay? So you don't wanna have that problem. You're gonna follow my system. You're gonna have the sexiest bulkheads in town. And then that, what everybody wants, let's get two more little pieces installed and we'll get on to taping that bulkhead. So now we got our two by three in place. It's time to take a look at the width of our bulkhead, 22 and a half, and that's perfect. So let me go cut some drywall up. Just a quick thing. Mark whenever you have an end, okay, of your framing, so you don't run into problems as you're going along. When you're doing this kind of work, realize it's easier to screw into the wood than the metal. Start with all the screws related to where the wood locations are. There we are. That looks amazing. As a rule, anything that's less than four feet by four feet can be held up with two screws. Okay, 
So don't overdo the pain. Once you got it up, it's supporting its own weight. You don't have to be awkwardly trying to hold it in place anymore. Try to pinch your drywall together with metal because see it always wants to separate. And then it'll pinch again. And that's fine until you have a screw in. Then you want to push. Okay, so that it doesn't separate. Or you'll lift that off the screw. Now, I'm going to stick one little piece of drywall on here. And I'm going to show you how I do my corner bead. All right, well, here we are. Now I've got the back done. I'm going to just close up this corner so I can show you how I tape my soffits. That is a lot of fun, eh? There we are. And one more. Okay. Of course, get nice and comfortable here. If your ladder has got good rubber feet, then this is easy. All right, there we go. That's a nice box. All right, guys, I taped the bulkhead, all the joints. We're gonna do the outside corner now. Now, this is a straight flex. There's a couple of different companies out there that offer the same kind of product. But here, let me just go through the basics. It is a wider roll than the traditional paper, but just a little bit, right? But what it does have that traditional paper doesn't have is a couple of things. It's really thick. And when you fold it in half, it gives you an outside corner, all right? And you can just relax it a little bit as you're setting it in. And the sides of the edge are perforated, so the mud can go through and bond Okay, it's kind of like a metal corner bead, how it has all the holes. Same kind of concept. What this does, it comes in a huge roll. So I can cut a piece of this for the whole length of the room. Huh? No joints. Perfect. So that's what we're going to do. And all I'm going to do is just roll it out on the wall. And I dragged it with me. There we go. It's really strong. You can't tear this with your hands. Gonna need snips. Now, as far as application goes, make sure you pre-crease it. You're gonna go through crazy amount of work trying to do that on the ladder or on your bench while you're using the mud tools. You only have so many hands, right? Get this all creased up. Stretch it on out. All right, get this in your pocket. I like to even throw it through my belt loop so I don't lose it. Okay, there we go. Up on the bench we go. Ha, ha. Yeah, have I showed you this yet? This is my new uh, Hawk paint. It screws on with the regular handle so I can switch tools as I work. Okay, consider getting one. It wasn't that expensive. And wow, what a game changer being up here while you're taping. You're doing a little four inch or something and then you can pull this out and do a whole trowel edge. All right, love this tool. There we go. Nice and generous here, off the side of the knife. The only thing you gotta watch out for is you don't walk off the end of your ladder. Again, nice and liberal to the underside. The thing is, you can only work with this stuff on the size of bench that you got. So if you're gonna work with a ladder, you're in a lot of trouble because this tape is pretty heavy. And catch. But if you got a bench like what I'm using, your bench is four feet wide. You can reach over a foot or so on each end and you can start off with a six foot piece. And that is a lot, a lot more handy because the more of this tape that you can get on to start with, the less it's going to be wanting to pull away. Here we go. Now we're going to take our paper corner. We're simply going to set it in. And, uh, right? I told you this stuff is really rigid, so it's going to fight with you a little bit. Okay, 
Here we go. Now, the secret here is you want to pinch the corner. You want this to extend a little lower and a little further up. So just pinch the corner, okay? Make sure that you're going to be able to fill it all later because you're manufacturing this on site. You've got to be wise to how that works. And I want to just clean that so that the pressure, you see the mud popping through the bead, okay? That is awesome. And then the same on the top. Let's just continue on here. The less opportunity I give this to fall apart and peel off the ceiling, the better. We're close to the end. Now it's time to get picky about the measurement, okay? We want to make this right on the money. Here we go. Now, just because I'm working quick doesn't mean that I don't have to be somewhat of a perfectionist. In this situation, you're better to put on more than you need. Be careful not to like leave areas like this, okay? Fill them up. Make sure that there's plenty of mud on the inside of that corner. That's where the strength is found, right? There we go. Let's get this set in position. I'll pull it this way. <clears throat> There we go. Give it that little pinch. So I have an extended corner. There we are. Okay. One last time. Beautiful. We're at a point where you have two options. You can let that dry or you can come back because remember, whenever you're doing paper, you want it wet so it doesn't bubble and blister, right? You could always throw a bit of a fill coat on just to make sure that everything is nice and wet. All right. And that will make the second application even better. And I'm not putting on too much mud. I'm just adding a little bit, making sure everything's wet. A little quick pass, okay? Nice pressure. There we go. That is how you make a 20, 30, 50, or 100 foot bulkhead perfect every time. I like to go rent tools. So we've got ourselves a drywall panel lift here, we've got a nine foot ceiling, and I'm gonna go through all the different steps that you wanna take because it's not just slap it up and walk away. There's actually an order of doing things. There are tips and tricks that I can share with you that'll make the process easy, and you're not gonna lose your hose bib. You're not gonna get confused as to where the pot lights are supposed to be drilled out. Let's just jump into this. First of all, what you wanna do is you wanna make a map. This is a project book. And in this book, I've got maps for everything in this basement. This one has just drawn out the space of the room, location of the lights, the distance between them, okay? Distance off the walls. When we're all finished, we wanna drill out the pot lights. We don't wanna do it as we go because we wanna be able to paint the ceiling. Every time we cut a hole in the ceiling and you paint, you're pulling more dirt into the paint as you go. It's bad enough we're gonna have a couple of heat runs that are gonna be exposed, but we don't wanna have all the pot lights. It just takes forever to get a good looking finish. So we're gonna make a map that'll solve that problem. Next thing you wanna do is grab yourself a marker. Because the way we do strapping and the way we always do strapping, it's just not continuous every 16 inches, okay? Because we're installing perpendicular to it. So you wanna find your strapping and you wanna mark your vapor barrier with your marker everywhere where you're strapping, where your screw lines are, all right? Nice and simple. Next step is inspect. Is it all nailed up? Are the nails all flush? Or they didn't need another shot. This is your quality control moment here because if the nails aren't all sunken in, then when you install your drywall, you're gonna have problems. Remember, construction isn't about getting it 50%, right? It's about doing everything perfect. So now we've got our strapping all good. I inspected all my nails. There we go. Now I'm ready to install. Now, one other thing, you wanna take a look for plumbing lines. One more time, really quick, just visualize. Here's my line. It's uh, on top of the strapping and I'm going to here. Make sure you're not using screws that are too long for the job just because they're handy. It's the wrong time to use a three inch screw. Get yourself a drywall screw that's one and a quarter if you're using half inch drywall or one and five eighths if you're using five eighths drywall. That's it. You wanna keep it the right size because we actually have a building code for how we do all of our mechanical work. And if you're installing drywall, you wanna follow the building code for the length of screw for your drywall so you don't accidentally penetrate a water line or electrical line and wreck one of your circuits. That would be detrimental. And we are here to move forward. It's time to close. You don't want to close and then a week or two from now you come back and go, hey, how come the lights aren't working? <laughs> That's the wrong time to find out that you put a screw through a wire. Installing drywall is really simple. All you got to do is measure at the end 
and then four feet over, all right? Get yourself a tape with a magnet on the end. It'll actually hold on to the soffit, and then you can measure across. My gap is exactly 130 and a half inches. I checked four feet out already, and it's just a touch wider. So we're gonna cut it 130 and a quarter because we're gonna put the ceiling up first. We wanna have a little wiggle room because we're gonna be putting drywall on the sides after to close the gaps. Don't drive yourself nuts trying to do drywall like a finished carpenter. Cut it a little small on purpose, and then after you put the sides on, all the gaps will be gone. That is how you do it properly. It's part of a good drywall job is organizing your materials. We got our four foot wide sheets by 12 foot, all stacked right here in the same room we're installing them in. We're gonna run our tape over here, 130 and a half. Grab yourselves a razor knife. Now this is a drywall square. It sits on top of the drywall. The way you cut drywall is really simple. Extend the blade to expose the tip because that's all we're doing. We're just cutting the paper. Don't cut all the way through the drywall. Ah. Use your toe, hold it against the board so it's not moving around. And you set the knife on the paper. Okay, turn it from the other way around. Finish scoring your paper. Now lift and twist, and then cut it from the back side. And remember, all we're cutting is the paper. All right, now's the fun part. Now you gotta put it on the lift. <laughs> Real quick, the lift, it's got these little locking mechanisms on it. We're pulling out the arms. Okay, you wanna get that done. That ought to be enough right there. The secret here is that you have to install the white paper facing the machine. Here we go. Up and on. Okay, from there, we just flatten it out. And we should be somewhat in the middle, okay? As long as it's somewhat in the middle, we'll be fine. Now, crawl underneath here. Now we're just gonna crank it up, get it out of your way. Get over to the wall. Okay, this is where the money is. So this all moves around. You wanna have the wheel facing you. And then you can push this all the way to the other wall. Pull the lever, that back down just a touch. All right, here we go. Let's drive it into position. Come on, baby, let's go. <clears throat> Hold on a second, boys. I need this out of balance on the other side. There, that'll work. Because this is still floating. There we go, okay. We're in. Now this is the point where we stop. A lot of people run into trouble with the first sheet. If the room isn't square, it won't fit right. So what I recommend is you can measure off 46 inches, put a marker on each of the sides, and then put the first sheet more in the middle of the room. That's a great way to get started. And then you can measure if your walls aren't square. This happens to be a brand new build and everything here is relatively square. So we're in good shape. The only thing we wanna do now is just take a level or two by four and push the edge right up against the wall if you have any gaps to close. Okay, and if it's too tight, hold the wheel, pull that, let a bit of tension off, and that'll make it easier to manipulate. There we go. Now we're gonna crank it nice and tight, make sure that all these corners are gonna screw up without a problem, and then we're gonna screw in the edges, okay? We wanna get, on a 12-foot sheet, you wanna get about 12 screws. One screw for every foot, so six on the front, six on the back. That'll be enough to hold it in place. Now you can see that screw went in too deep. So you can use a regular screw gun, but you gotta have a lot of control to get a perfect depth. It is gonna drive you nuts. You can also get a bit, it's called a dimpler bit, costs about two or three bucks. Goes to the end here and it does the same thing as this tool. This is a drywall screw gun. Here we go. All right, what you do is you adjust the depth on the collar so that when you put in a screw, you don't get a click. If the screw's sticking out too far, you're gonna hit the edge, and that's not deep enough. So you can go too deep, not deep enough, or just perfect. And the difference is nanometers. Once you get a fair amount of screws in there, lower this down, get it out of the way, okay? All right. Make sure that you get five screws for every strap. 
one on each end, one in the middle, and then split the difference, okay? Anywhere where you miss the strapping, you pull the screw out, you can't leave it in, take the back of your four in one, four inch knife, and just dent another hole. That way you're ready for mudding when it's time to do that. Now, let's get into using some roto zipping. We'll show you some new tools. So whenever you get a heat duct, the secret here is gonna be, we're going to be roto zipping the inside of the duct. This one's actually attached and screwed to the framing, flush to the finish. What you do is from the middle, you draw an arrow and the distance to the center of the duct. Now it's a six inch line, so it's three inches. That's simple. And then when your drywall goes on, you can plunge the hole and zip it out without any difficulty at all, knowing the distance from this point and the location relative to the wall. You don't have to pull out a measuring tape for that. All right, now listen, if your protrusions aren't right at the edge of the drywall and you need to measure off, okay, then do that, get a mark, and just put the mark close to a piece of strapping, right? So let's say my hole was right here, my duct. All right, I would then measure off 31 inches, five inches over. So I'd go like this, measure my five, make my arrow, and then write my number. That's my mark, off that arrow, out 31. It's that simple. Because you're dealing with something that's five or six inches round, it's okay to not be exact and precise. You'll see when we wrote a zip that the tool does the work for you. Now, let's see if we're still square. Let's use the knee and the magnet. Yeah, we're still the same, 130 and a half. How about that? There's no framing here, right? Am I allowed to install the drywall if it's like there's nothing to screw the corner to? Yes, if you expect it to never see any action, right? If no one's ever gonna be touching that corner, maybe you can get away with it. But the truth is, you don't know what people are gonna do. And if you don't have backing behind your drywall, you are gonna get cracks. <clears throat> so, stick some backing in there. Avoid your cracks. Live to fight another day, all right? It's as simple as a piece of wood and a couple of screws, if I had it up high enough. This isn't about having these pieces of wood connected. This is about having something here, so if there's pressure put in the drywall, it keeps it from too much deflection, okay? Now, question I get. Jeff, do you have to put drywall on the ceiling first? I've had so many people in the comment sections over the years. Here we go, Maddie, give me a hand with that. Tell me, you have to put the drywall on the ceiling first. That's the rule. And I'm like, yeah, maybe. It's also a rule to take your vitamins. Not everybody does it. But here's the deal. Whoops, wrong drill. <laughs> the truth is, you don't need the drywall attached to the wall to hold the ceiling up. The entire sheet is held up with two screws. Trust me, when I put a sheet on the ceiling and I put five screws every 16 inches, it ain't bloody well going anywhere. And for everybody who's arguing right now, think about this. If your room is more than eight feet wide, the sheet in the middle doesn't have any extra support on the sides. Oh, and it doesn't fall down. So let's not get our knickers in a knot. There are times when it makes sense. This sheet, for instance, was had the brown paper facing out and I can't put it on my lift without flipping the whole bloody thing over. That doesn't make any sense. It made sense to just toss this on the wall, get it out of my way, because the next sheet it has got the white paper facing out, and that'll make getting on the lift much easier for me. Next question I get. This is a really good one, actually. How many screws do I put in a row? Well, truth is, you're supposed to have five. That is the code in the building code for installing drywall. One, two, three, four, and then one at the top. I'll get there in a minute. Oh, jeepers. There we go. Not every screw in the bucket is going to be a good screw. All right? You're going to have accidents, so don't worry about it. People ask me all the time, can I cut the hole first and then stick it over the box? Or do I have to buy a drywall cutout tool? The truth is, the drywall cutout tool makes things much quicker, and it eliminates the step of preparation when you're taping. So, if you're really good with measuring, you might get away with it. Okay, so let's take a look at this. We'll try the system out, and I'll show you how I'd like to do it. I'm going to take an actual measurement of this box off the framing. 65 and 3 quarters, and then 68. And then I'm going to measure from my joint, not the ground. And I'm going to measure to the top of this little spot here and the bottom of this spot here. That is 30 and 3 quarters, and whoop. 34 and a half. 
I'm giving myself just a little bit of wiggle room here, okay? Because I don't have to fuss around with it later. That's the dimensions. So here's how we do this. 65 and three quarters. Put a mark. 68. Put a mark. Using this square, I can put my, my square on the pencil line. And I'm going to go to 30 and three quarters. On this side of the square, it measures down. This side it measures up. So, boom. There's my depth. And then I got 34 and a half. Okay. <clears throat> there we go. So I'm going to line up that line. And I'll line up this line. Boom. There is my box. Okay. Piece of cake, eh? And if you want to, you can go to the store and you can get something like this. Drywall saw, the teeth intermittently go like this. Does a great job of cutting a hole. And the system is simple. You line it up in the corner, plunge it. And that can save you a lot of money. As you can see, I'm running into trouble in this particular situation because my drywall is taller than my hole. So I actually have to trim off the bottom. Because one of the rules of drywall is this. You do need to have factory edges up against factory edges when at all possible. Whenever you're going to cut a sheet, you need two things. You need a pencil and a tape measure. Okay? You measure all three ends. This is 46 and a half. Get in the habit of writing your information down on the wall. Go to the middle especially in basements. Well, 46 and a half still works. I don't mind a little gap in the bottom. That's almost tight. Okay, so if it's really tight down there, so I'm gonna go 46 and a quarter. And I'll let the variance in the gap be at the floor, okay? The reason we're not gonna just cut across the top, we're gonna cut across the bottom, is because this is tapered edge. This is thinner than the rest of the board. The board travels like this, and it gets to the edge, and it scoops in. And then you want the next board to have that scoop. So you can put your mud in your paper and get a flush finish, okay? So, 46 and a quarter. Find my mark here, come across. And this is how I cut drywall. It's a great system. Lots of guys will go like this, right? They'll put the blade on the tape and they'll just use this finger here to guide. But you gotta have callus to do this, all right? We're homeowners here. And you guys don't have that callus. So, if you use the tool, you can set the blade on the aluminum and into the drywall, just the tip. We're just cutting paper. Slice it all the way down here. And when you get to the end, lift it up. Boom. Okay, perfect every time. This is half inch drywall, it breaks real easily. Okay, so just a little bit of a roll, get it snapped, and then you can fold it. And the way we do this is we reach underneath. We stick the blade through the inside of that corner. Okay, and then we're gonna pull it towards us but instead of moving your arm, move your whole body. You can't cut yourself if you're going like this. But if you start slicing like this, ouch. I've had people ask me all the time, how do I make my edges nice? <laughs> you know, it's just drywall. But I'll show you this while I'm thinking about it because some applications, like if you're building bulkheads or you make a mistake when you're putting your butt joints together and you cut the wrong end of the drywall, you might need to make it smooth. And you use a tool like this. Knock down all those ridges. Okay, that's called a rasp. And it can be your best friend whenever you make a mistake. Okay. Here's where we're gonna learn a lesson, kids. Um, I measured to the location of my box from the height of the box, right here. But wouldn't you know, this back wall, it's an exterior wall and Unless things are perfectly square and plumb, okay, you can't measure from here because this wall goes like this. <laughs> so my measurement came from here, which is much bigger than where the box is. So now my hole is not lined up right. And it's not the end of the world. Now before I worry about that electrical box, I'm gonna hang the sheet again with two screws. I know, I know, I know. But if you don't break through the paper, then that screw head will hold a lot of weight. A full sheet of drywall, 10 feet long, weighs about 50 pounds. So that's only 25 pounds of screw. All right, 
Let me go take a look at how bad my situation is here. That wall is out of level by almost half an inch. So this is what happens. You're going to come back here now and you're going to be doing this all day long for the rest of your life, which is why we use the cutout tool. Really quick, electrical boxes are notorious for causing nail pops. All right, how to avoid nail pops? Well, here's one way. Don't put screws near the corners here, okay? You see these two tabs? There's an electrical box, the, the plug gets installed over top of it. And they get tightened up until the box is putting pressure on the drywall itself, okay? So if anything is close to it with a screw and it's not in perfectly, this movement here is gonna pop it off the head. So, always at least six inches away. So you can avoid that kind of problem, okay? To solve ugly messes like this, do not buy a two foot by three foot wall plate, okay? Get yourself a little bit of expansion foam, have it handy. These new cans are awesome because the tips don't seal up. You just take off the dry part and it's good tomorrow, which is amazing for what we're doing. We're just gonna throw a little bit of foam in here. Oh, hopefully it's not too excited. These things are a little unpredictable too, so be ready for that. Okay, there we go. We'll get back to this later in the video and we'll show you what to do. Question I get, Jeff, how do you avoid having to get a chalk line out or measuring off where all the studs are? Ready for this? This one's gonna blow your mind. Put a screw on your drill, hold it where the other screw was and trust the fact that the framers like to make things go up and down, <laughs> relatively speaking, and then just loosen up your hands, whoosh, let gravity drop the drill. Boom, stud. And you can do that all the way to the bottom, over and over and over again. Nice and quick. You don't have to think twice, all right? This will increase your speed of installation dramatically. Not to mention using a drywall screw gun with a depth setting chart and gauge on it. This allows me to adjust the depth that I'm setting the screw at, which is important because if you're just doing half inch drywall, it's one depth. But if you're doing layers, like for soundproofing, you're gonna find you need a little minor adjustments. I also need to adjust this for steel or wood because the screw head reacts differently. Jeff, what do I do when I break through the paper? This is guaranteed to fail. It's gonna be a nail pop. So, treat it like a nail pop. Put another screw in and don't break the paper. That's all you have to do. You don't have to remove it. Just make sure you put another one next to something that broke through the paper. Piece of cake. Next question. Do I have to cut my drywall first? And the answer is no, you're better not to. And I'll tell you why. Because of the level and square issue, you don't know how your drywall is gonna line up. And even if you measure it first and then cut and you think you got the right measurement, you might be wrong. So, install your drywall, take your knife, just scratch the paper, okay? There's a lot of plastic here. All right. And you grab it, two hands, and you fold it. And that is perfect every time, all right? And then we just trim it off. And I'll watch this, because uh, I see people do this all the time. They're being way too aggressive when they're cutting paper. I'm, I want you to look how thin that paper is, okay? It's thinner than an eight and a half by 11 you use in, in school. Like it's really super thin. You don't have to stick a knife in there. You don't have to pull your blade on, rah, all right? It's just nice and easy. This one blade, I've installed almost all the drywall in the entire basement, all right? It goes this easy. Just the tip, just a little scratch, done, all right? This does not work. And if you fold it nice and tight, it guides the blade. If you go like this, you're gonna be all over the place and have a lot to clean up. You fold it in nice and tight, all right? Then you can open up your blade and with the base of the blade, you can trim back any extra pieces that are in the way. And remember, as long as that tip is sharp, it's good to use. And if it loses its edge, okay, that's all, piece of cake. Next question, Jeff, I'm just doing a simple project. Do I gotta go out and buy a brand new tool? No, you can go out and get this, okay? This is a really nice version of a dimpler bit. It's adjustable, but they also have a $3 version that works pretty darn all right. Basically, it's the same thing. You set the depth on it, okay? And then you just, you can use any drill. That's an impact driver for Pete's sake. And it works. Okay, another tip. When you're hanging drywall, mark where your wood is. As soon as I start putting that sheet up here, I've lost any ability to know where the two by fours in that ceiling are. All right. And you always mark the middle, not the edge. There we go. Now we're ready to throw the drywall up. 
Now, if you're a fan of the channel, you've seen me using drywall lifts for years now. And there's a reason for it. Uh, I get asked, how come you don't just lift it up and use a two by four? Or two guys on a ladder? Here's why. I'm a 53 year old man. When God gives you a bridge to cross the highway, you take it. You don't run around playing Frogger. This is heavy, it's awkward. You don't want to be on a ladder. You know how easy it is to pull a muscle and there goes your whole weekend, right? Rent the bloody tool. It only costs pennies a day. And when you use a drywall lift to install your ceilings, you can put, I don't know, maybe 20 sheets up in an entire day. It's a one day rental. How many people are putting 20 sheets of drywall on their ceiling? Trust me, it's an investment that's worth it because this is so much easier. When I was young and dumb, I used to sit here fighting and holding with my head. All you got on your drywall was a grease spot that showed up through the ceiling paint. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and there are people out there going, oh, that's what that discoloration is. Yep. Oil from your head in the paper with latex paint leaves a stain. So if you're gonna avoid it, just use the lift. Now real quick, so you know, this is your safety lever. Hold onto the wheel, lift while you're cranking and it releases, okay? So I'm gonna push forward and lift at the same time. And then I can back this up. And you'll notice I don't have all the screws in. Okay. Just the edges. I just marked out where the studs are, that's it. Once I get all the drywall hung, I can get this out of my way, jump on a ladder and fill in all the holes. Another question, what do we do if it's not square? Right, so I'm straight across this wall. I got a gap here and no gap here. Nothing square. Which is one of the reasons why a lot of people do the ceilings first. Because then they can cover gaps with the wallboard. That's the only reason it goes up first. It's not for structure, it doesn't carry any weight. It's got nothing to do with that. It's just to manage gaps. However, that's why I only did it on one side. Now if my I have a gap over here, it's fine because I'm gonna put on a wallboard to cover it, okay? By the way, if you're doing a basement job, you need a marker. Here's why. Walls have plastic on it, okay? And the marker, you can write, on, even on dirty plastic, the center for all your studs. Not just there, but also on your vapor barrier, on your ceiling, you can mark off your stud locations on the plastic. All right, so make sure you get yourself a decent marker and it'll save you a lot of hassle. While I'm here drawing pictures, uh, I get a question like this all the time. Um, people have a tub, okay? Here's the tub in their house, right? Yay. And what they do is they'll install cement board up to about three inches past the tub all the way to the ceiling. All right, and they ask me, how do I join the drywall? Right here, how do, what do we do with that joint? Here's the system, okay, ready? You don't join them together. You don't worry about that. What you're gonna do is you're gonna tile just past that joint, all right? It's okay to tile on drywall as long as it's outside of the wet area. The wet area is literally mostly right here. So you've got cement board past your tub. You're tiling a couple inches onto the drywall. No mesh tape, no thin set, no adhesives, no nothing. Ignore it, it does not matter, all right? Neither of these materials expand and contract, as a rule. So as long as you know that you're gonna be tiling past it, you can ignore that joint like it doesn't even exist. And I know that offends some people's minds because there's always the, the types of folks out there who wanna cock every crack, even if it isn't gonna cause you an issue. This is how we do it, all right? The only other option you have, yes. instead of cement board, you can use Schluter, Schluter Curdy board, okay? And you can bring that right out into the middle of the room. Doesn't matter. Because Schluter Curdy board, you can actually tape that joint with the drywall like a butt joint. Paper tape and compound, regular all-purpose compound. And then you can do your tile work, all right? And then you can even come back and you can smooth coat that orange board with drywall compound, sand it down nice and paint it. It actually works. <laughs> it's one of the tricks of the business, all right? So if you don't wanna have a gap in behind your tile, use the orange board, bring it out past your tile and tape the joint to the drywall. Piece of cake. So here's another thing, okay? Questionable installation system. This water line is, uh, on clips, right next to the stud, 
right at the surface because it was brought on the inside of the vapor barrier, which is a proper way to do it. But it contravenes common sense with what happens when the drywaller gets here. What if this stud's on an angle? What if Jeff is guessing where the stud is, right? Here's a system that we use, D and S, okay? Means do not screw. When you see something like this, measure it off, get your pencil out, take that location, and just put this on your drywall, all right? It's okay in this scenario to not put any screws on this stud and just attach here and here, all right? Which would you rather have? The potential of a nail pop over the potential of a basement flood three or four weeks from now? Just saying. All right, far and away, the most important question I get asked is how to do a proper bud joint. What happens when my wall is longer than the drywall? Now, you don't have to have a 20-foot wall to have this problem. You can have a 10-foot wall, but you can't bring any more than eight feet down your stairwell. Lots of basements are made that way, where you just can't navigate more than oh, a four by eight sheet of drywall. So, I've showed you in the past, and I've talked about strapping, right? And honestly, you can put strapping in. You can put in a five-foot piece of strapping that goes to the entire joint, plus it attaches here, and then you can con just continue drywalling. That's a cheat, but it's not ideal. So today I'm going to show you the proper way to do a butt joint, okay? And here it is. I've got a, well, let's call it a 13 foot and change wall. And this is my 12 foot drywall. Now you'll see the top piece. I've cut a whole long piece over here and I got a joint and a little bit more, okay? Here's why. If my drywall came to here, I don't want to just measure and cut it so that I finish in the middle of this side, okay? Because then I've only got one piece in this, there's no real rigidity here. I'd like to have a larger piece. So what I'm going to suggest is that you go back to the stud like this, okay? And what we're going to do is we're going to measure left to right off the corner to get our length on the wood. And the way you do this to keep it from falling off is you have to put your finger, put your finger on the tape and, and keep pressure, keep resistance on your tape, all right? And that'll hold the other end in place nine times out of ten, six days a week. Here we go. Now I'm going to just hold it against the drywall. 131 and a half is dead smack in the middle. Again, write it down. So I measure left to right, but now I'm going to measure right to left because I want to have the factory butt joint on both sides of this line. Okay, so here we go. 131 and a half, 131 and a half. Boom. Okay. Now I use my square. All right. Now I have that piece. I need a second sheet, right? So what I do is I want to measure, and you have to be careful here. If you measure into this, this area here, you're measuring a thinner part of the wall, okay? Get your tape a couple inches above the joint, so you're actually measuring the half inch thick. Come across, my line is 28 and a half and a hair. Okay, again, measure, reverse, 28 and a half and a hair, okay. I want to put the inside corner in first and then attach this piece, okay? I don't want to attach the big one and then try to fill the inside corner in case everything's not square, all right? Let's get that out of here. Here's my factory edge. The way we do this is we're not going to be worried about this corner, okay? We're worried about here. And if I set this seam tight against this seam on both sides, that means this becomes a right angle, okay? And then the next sheet of drywall that goes on will be nice and tight against it. So, uh, let's get our little foot pedal in place. Let's lift the drywall up. There we go. Now you see I'm in the middle of that stud. And of course the stud has got more meat showing at the top than the bottom, and that's fine, that's normal. And I'm not gonna put any screws in here just yet. That sheet's not going anywhere. I like it where it is. We're gonna move on and get ready for this. On huge walls, 
and we'll just for the difference for you guys I'm going to do the rotor zip on the plug here you'll see the difference in the quality and the speed and you appreciate the tool so I'm putting an arrow so I don't forget this Jeff there's something here that needs to be cut out and I'm going to measure to the middle of the box 35 inches here's a system that works it works oh yeah why not show you this this is a great way to carry drywall by yourself use your wing two hands compression okay done you can drive that bad boy around all by yourself if no one's around to help you it's not an excuse to take it off <laughs> Matt's like fine old man do it yourself then <laughs> for the sake of being perfect Matt I'm gonna get you to help me out working with 12 foot sheets is not something you want to do alone because you can't manage lifting the sheet and manage closing this gap all by yourself all right anyway let me just hang this sheet in place thank you for your help sir all right here's the standard process all right we're stitching in the wound one screw on each side on a five degree angle not square okay and the heads should almost be touching each other all right that tight and the way we do it like this is for this reason drywall likes to break and if there's too much gap it has somewhere to go stitching on a five degree angle get you a nice clean joint there we go okay one two three four five locations as always okay now we know how to screw it together I'm going to do the cutout tool and I'm going to show you how to tape the butt joint that's right and then we're going to show you uh, how to avoid blisters and um, air bubbles and all that kind of cool stuff coming right up okay coming down here 35 inches all right there's my spot I'm loving that <sighs> just to help you out the shape of the box is this okay and what we're doing is we're going to punch a hole run it to the side when we hit the metal we'll jump to the other side and then we'll have pressure like this as we drive around knowing that when I get here I'll just do a little jump hit the box and then I'm going to have pressure this way as I drive down the box and then pressure upwards on an angle as I drive this side of the box and so on and so forth a little bit of experience you can get this done real quick in a hurry okay so now there's no need for any foam there's no need for any fooling around we're good to go again six inches from the box okay that's the rule that's my rule anyway all right nice and easy okay all right well welcome to the next day as you can tell we got a lot done but in typical jeff fashion you know i made notes on my drywall to tell me where the heat run was going to be when i forgot to rotor zip it out so today i got to climb up here and make a mess i got my site all cleaned up but now I'm gonna go and make a big dust cloud typical eh? important when you're working when you have a system even if you forget to do something because you got a system you can always go back and find the hole if I didn't have a system I would never know where that thing was and then I'd be pulling a sheet of drywall down and then measuring it off and marking it all over again having a system is key to staying organized I'm just gonna confirm my measurement from the marking over to this hole zip out a small hole to confirm that the heating duct is there and then I'm going to go and rip the big hole just a quick tip the shaft on this is smooth it does not cut and when I first started I had the guard too low so I was trying to cut drywall with a smooth shaft make sure you set your guard high enough that you're in the cutting wheel okay and be easy on yourself this ductwork is incredibly flexible so even when you get the pilot on it it tends to wobble it's not a real big deal most people until you get really really proficient with that tool are going to run into this problem you're going to have a little bit of an oval because the metal will bend underneath the weight of your way you solve that just have a little bit of expansion foam here and this does two things which is why i love expansion foam one it's going to seal it in place 
Okay, that'll hold that nice and flush so that when you put in the device after the fact with the, um, the damper on it, okay, it's not going to be falling out of the ceiling because it'll be nice and secure. The pipe isn't going to move up and down. You'll get a great fit. After this foam is dry, you cut it off with a knife. You can put the tape and the mud over it. You're going to have a beautiful looking ceiling. Anyway, ah, that is how you do drywall in a 2,000 square foot basement. Have the right tools, have the right equipment, make great notes. <laughs> make sure you got a map for your electrical. And if you tie all that system together, you'll be able to have a great result and you aren't going to lose your lights, your plugs or your heat exhaust. One of the most common mistakes people make when they're doing their taping, there we go, is they get the pre-mixed mud, they grab it out of the box, there we go, time to tape. Now, if I had a dollar for everybody who asked me, Jeff, how do I avoid having bubbles in my tape? I'm going to answer it the hard way. I'm going to screw the job up here on purpose, okay? So, you take your mud, you haven't done anything to it yet, and you press it in your, into your bead, and you're going to bed your tape. Okay? Now you get your tape, and you try to do everything right, you get a nice edge, and you put that in there. And here's what we're going to do for you guys. I'm going to show you how to do it wrong, and then we're going to film the rest of this video the next day after this is dried and bubbled up. So you'll be able to go, oh, so that's how it happens. And I'm gonna tape this piece right so that you can see the difference, okay? Now, a lot of people, you know, you're gonna press that tape on. There we go. It's bedded. That looks good, right? Nice and clean. Looks like, looks like a drywall job, eh? That one's gonna bubble, okay? And here's why. Rule number one with mud has to be worked up. You can't just take it out of the box or the pail and start working with it. It has to be mixed. Either use a mixer or use a four inch knife on your hawk. Okay. What this does is it softens it up. All right. Now, in a perfect world, you should also add a little bit of moisture. But if you follow this taping process, all right, let's get it on there. Same thing. I'm going to work right up to the butt joint here for the purpose of this demonstration. <laughs> okay, and let's leave a gap here on purpose. Okay. So far, it looks a lot like the same, eh? Not a lot's changed here, Jeff. What are you doing? What are you teaching me? Here's what I'm going to teach you. This is going to save your bacon. Press it out, just like before. Nothing new here. Now, this is where the fans of the channel know what I'm going to do. Wait a minute. That's it? Yep. You have to add more moisture to the paper by putting a skim coat right over top. Okay? And always clean. This looks different than this because it's wet and that's dry. I guarantee you, tomorrow when we come back, this is going to have blisters in it. And then I'll show you how to fix those blisters too. We're back in this corner. This is the tape that I did without any surface tape. You can see how dark it is. Look at the dark yellow. This is tape that has been mudded over top. This stuff shouldn't bubble. This stuff should. If I know what I'm talking about, it'll bubble up. So let's put a little bit of moisture on here and see what happens. Hopefully, we'll get some action. All right, we're gonna give that one minute so that the bubbles can show up. Now, in the meantime, here's a couple little trip ticks for you, all right? Um, whenever you're working, always take your four inch knife and clean any ridges, okay? Before you add more mud. Remember, the goal here is to fill gaps, okay? So if you leave a ridge, you're not filling a gap. Now you're filling the gap plus with what's in the ridge, plus all around the ridge, all right? Keep it nice and simple. Second coat, first coat we go four inch. Second coat we go six inch, okay? And we want to build up both sides and create a nice clean edge. And the way we do that is we apply the mud, okay? Nice and clean. And then I put the knife in the corner and I'm going to 
clean out any extra. I'm going to come over here with pressure and feather that edge. And then I'm going to go back and I'm going to press and fill it in. That should give you a really perfect edge, okay? Now, then you do the back side. Four inch and then a six inch. And yeah, that's four days and that's okay. Because this is not a rush, okay? We're looking to get perfect. If you want to be fast, go use all the commercial machines. Get the banjo that does these edges. Get the uh, bazooka that does all your inside corners, okay? The problem with those machines is they don't bed the tape like this, okay? I can walk into any brand new house, one, two, three, five years old. I can just go to the middle of the wall, cut it, grab that paper, whoosh, rip it right off the wall. And it's never bedded. It's just laid in there with some mud, right? This is called bedding. This gives you a best finish that you can get. My process gives you the best corners you can get. Everything else is a joke. It's about speed. But this is supposed to be an art. It's a skill. Now, when you buy brand new tools, get a sanding sponge. Okay, sand it for a few minutes. Both sides. A lot of these knives come from the factory with little dimples or, or ridges. Okay, and you want to sand that out. It's microscopic almost, but it's true. And then when you go do this, you're gonna have these thin little edges and ridges in your mud. And that means you're gonna to have to come back and sand all that smooth later. So better to sand your tool once than every joint you work with for the rest of your life. Is there anything bubbling? I gotta pull this off now and see. <laughs> ah, isn't that something? Even when you don't make the tape as wet as it should be to avoid bubbling, if you bet it properly, it doesn't bubble. I guess that's the answer to the question how to keep your tape from bubbling. Proper bedding. Now, if you watch the YouTube, if you watch the shorts, you'll see this. They'll take a bunch of mud, all right? And they'll go, well, look how fast I am. And they'll throw tape on that, okay? The problem is, so much bloody mud on the wall, it doesn't have a choice but to blister. Less is more. That's actually my second coat now. Think about it. Do you want to put 30 boxes of mud on the wall or five? This is a whole basement project. We are looking for a flat surface. Less is more. If you use this tool, you'll always get a straight line. Doesn't matter how much pressure you put on your edge, okay? It doesn't bend. It's not like those other tools. And by the way, uh, we're doing a video coming up real soon where I explore the difference between the hawk and the pan pros and cons, and what tools you should be buying. I have a little bit of a bias, obviously, but that's because I love this tool. 4x10, ergonomic handle, German steel. Hmm? Can't go wrong with this tool, and I can't use it with a pan. I gotta use some other little hokey, sticky thing. Anyway, um, let me go show you a few more tips here about doing some joints inside, outside corners, and what do you do when your drywall is damaged and it's installed? How do you fix it while you're taping? That's a big problem that a lot of people have. I got a few more tricks up my sleeve. Let's just jump right into it. Next tip is when your kids use permanent marker on your walls. Now this isn't even a drywall tip. It could be a painting tip. But the point is this, um, there is a solution for permanent marker. So if you're on the job site and you can't find a pencil and you gotta make a mark, it's okay. Always have a can of oil-based aerosol spray. Now this is the odorless Zinsser. Um, I always use Kills, but Kills has had supply issues recently keeping them stocked on the market. It might be my fault, I'm not sure. <laughs> the, this product works as well, okay? It's available in the local hardware store. There we go. You just throw a little bit of that on there and there's enough solid white pigment in there that it just eliminates that black mark. Boom, ready to be painted in about 10 minutes. Okay, so now we're taking a look at an outside 45. This is not a 90, this is a 45. And this is 5 8 soundproof drywall, right? So like, it's a bit of a challenge. You can't just use a knife on this. Gonna wanna get yourself a good old fashioned carpenter saw, fine tooth, okay? And you can just run it right against the drywall. Trim up your edge perfectly. Perfect, all right? That gives you a lot of exposed drywall, right? So here's how we're gonna handle that. Gonna blow your mind. We're just gonna use some compound. And this isn't about being pretty, this is about getting it done, okay? the top as well. If I'm going to demonstrate a joint. I might as well just do the joint. <laughs> All right. 
here we go. That's pretty damn muddy. We take our paper, we're going near a ceiling. Cut it straight, okay? We're gonna set it right up to the ceiling and right up against the side here. We're gonna cover all that exposed drywall, okay? There we go. I'm gonna bed the tape. Make sure you get a little bit of moisture on there. Okay, now, now we got an edge. That's good. When you go to the drywall store, um, or your Home Depot, or your Lowe's, or whatever, your building store, you're gonna find this product. Perfect 90 or straight edge. There's a couple different competitors. Okay, and we're gonna go that tall. This stuff is basically a uh, cardboard version. It's really rigid, okay? It's not cardboard, it's somewhere. Kind of like a mix of cardboard and plastic. But you can make your own corner beads out of this stuff. All right, you just fold it over, really press it good. You can make your own outside corner beads. Because for whatever reason, the stores are having a hard time keeping the metal with paper version of the outside corner stocked. Drives you nuts. Over the last couple of years, every time I've gone to the store and I need a certain kind of designer bead for a fancy corner, they're never in stock. So here we go. Now I got that. Step two, and this is good for any kind of repair. Ready? Paper and mud, with paper and mud, with paper and mud. If you have to patch a hole a mile long, you can do it all in the same coat. You don't have to wait for it to dry in between, all right? Oh, of course, your hole's that big. You might want to just put another sheet of drywall on them, but hey, I'm letting you know there's nothing to stop you from layering compound and paper. Never a bad thing. Okay, here we go. Other side of the corner. Working with the side of the knife. And I'm vertically challenged. All right, there we go. Don't want to have any bare spots, okay? Too much mud is fine. Not enough will get you every time. Here we go. Now, White side out, the dark side, it's got really fiber, okay, fibrous kind of feel. It's gonna have a great bond. Now, you can make whatever kind of corner you want with this, okay? Get down to the bottom, just trim off the bottom. It's fine if you come short. We're gonna put on trim, right? Three and a half usually is a minimum baseboard. So don't worry about that. Now with the four inch, you just take it and you just, you bed that tape. Okay, see I'm only in, the, my edge of the knife is in the middle of the bead. Okay. Bedding it in the middle. So I'm cleaning it first time just to flatten this out a little bit, right? All, way over the edge. And then I'm gonna come back in the middle and press it down. The reason I'm doing that is I'm trying to trap as much mud in behind that corner as I can. So it's solid, it's filled. And then my, when I press it, I'm creating a void. Here, let me see if we can get this on camera, Max. Yeah. A void from this point to this point that can be filled. See that? Good shadow? Because if you got a void, you can fill it. If you have a hump, well, then you're just in a whole lot of hurt when it comes to drywall. Okay, there we go. Clean it out, and then bed it. All right, now we're done. Or are we? <laughs> like I said, this is all paper. Paper and mud. Feel free to come back now, okay, and do a fill coat. Even if your mud is a little dirty or chunky, or your trowel is needing to be sand. 
sanded and scratchy. See, I only ever work with one edge of my, my blade. Watch this. Nice and smooth, right? Here's the unsanded edge. You see that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but I only work with one side, so I'm fine. I'm actually kind of lazy that way. There we go. All right. That's how you can build yourself an outside corner in any environment, no matter what the condition of your drywall, no matter what the condition of the angle. This works perfect every time. Okay? Now it's going to take probably three fills in order to do that job because when you put that much mud on it, it shrinks as it dries. All right? Don't worry about it. Three coats in three days is fine because remember, the inside corners take four days to do properly. So you're doing just fine. Now, let me show you the inside version of the same corner because there's another trick for that one you're going to want to watch. Okay, so now we're doing the same kind of angle, 45 on the inside corner. Now, I managed to get a bead this time. So here's the metal corner with the paper on it. Okay, that doesn't mean it's going to be easy. I can't just put the mud in and put this on and walk away. Um, I did use a little bit of foam, right? So I want to trim that back anywhere that is sticking out too proud. And wow, that's just so I can fill up the gap a little bit. If you're a fan of the channel, you know that you have to fill gaps. You can't just expect the paper to do all the work. So if you add expansion foam first, then you can mud right over top of it. And if, even if it doesn't fill the whole space, it makes it so you don't have to have so much mud in that hole. And then it won't take like three weeks to try. So let me show you my problem here. This corner was framed atrociously, not by yours truly. So here's my, my line in the corner. There it is. You're going to have situations like this, right? I mean, people will say, hey, we're a fan of the channel because when there's mistakes, you guys show how to fix it. Well, here's a mistake, right? If you frame with a laser level, then you won't run into this problem. And all this is is um, getting this, the connection point. One of these walls isn't level. And I'm not sure which. And it doesn't even matter. But look where my middle of the joint. Follow it up. And look at the distance. I am way out. Now, if I throw this in here and I put the seam on my red line and I try to go to there, I am in a lot of trouble, right? I can't make that work. But if I go to there and I just move my laser level over a chunk, I move my line. So now I'm in the middle. And so it goes one way at the top, one way at the bottom, but I can set this up. Because this is a corner, and I can, I can lay that bead in a lot of different variations. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to lay the bead in a variation that puts that, this crease on the laser line. Okay? And I'm going to set that in the mud on that crease down there. And I'll simply roll it around to hit the crease there. This will get the perfect illusion of that being perfectly level. In this situation, you want to leave the laser line on. And you want to mud each side of this line, like as if it's the inside corner. Okay? Making sure to fill up any gaps that need to be filled. So that the paper bead will actually rest nice in that corner. And the benefit is this. Um, you're walking through a room and you see a post. A supporting post holding up the house is level. And then it hits your eye. This corner and that post. They'll be in the same alignment and you'll go... Whoa, they're like this, right? What crappy workmanship. If there's no post, you just go home. Maybe on the right certain day, the right kind of lighting. But in this scenario, having this trick up your sleeve, and you see this knife? There's the blue and the white. The blue is where the metal is. Because I'm cheating, I have to actually bed that tape and press it in even tighter than I would have usually, okay? Really bed that in. Okay? Now, this is going to be a bit of a challenge, getting this all pretty. All right? Don't worry about it. Here's the goal. First day, you go one side. So we're going to use the four-inch knife, and we're simply going to fill with the tip in this groove. We're going to use that as our guide. We'll clean. And we'll fill. 
Okay. Here we go. Get rid of the excess. All right. And we'll fill again. Here goes my knife. Okay. We'll get that so close to perfect, no one will be able to tell the difference from a thousand miles away. Here we go. It may not seem like a big issue if it's not perfect. Okay. But, okay, put a picture on the wall and hang it level. And then you're going to have a one-inch gap here and a two-inch gap at the top. It's going to look like silly, right? Making things straight and level, it's part of being a professional. And so if you're a DIYer and you want to do things on your own, you got to learn how to do it professional or it just screams from across the room. All right? Don't cut corners on your, on your work. Tricks like this can turn a bad framing job into a great drywall finish. Of course, the other option that you have is to ignore everything I just showed you <laughs> and grab one of these tools. Okay, this black spatula, it's available at uh, specialty drywall stores, okay? And you can just take a good chunk of mud and you can run an inside smooth corner, all right? And that's great if you're painting everything the same color. <laughs> Not so great if you're doing an accent wall, <laughs> but it is an option. And it is another way to cheat so that you can do an inside corner rounded and there is no definitive line for anybody to judge against. So now I'm going to show you how to fix damaged drywall, okay? This particular sheet was damaged by the forklifts at the store that they were selling it. Um, here I got good solid hard, good solid board with brown paper. Over here I've got damaged board, okay? And honestly, a lot of people in this business we just push this up, leave it all soft and mushy, and then tape it, all right? Problem is, is that's not strong enough to even withstand the pressure of rolling it. So you're gonna end up getting problems with that down the road. Over here, I got a piece of drywall that's damaged. And if it doesn't have any structural integrity, then you need to have some integrity yourself, okay? You gotta fix this stuff. There we go, that's nice and strong. It's just brown. That brown paper blisters if you don't seal it. A little bit of oil-based primer sealer, problem solved. Give that 10 minutes. This area over here, you, it's just mush. Okay, so what we're gonna do, we're gonna just cut it right out. Get rid of the mush. You see how that's all just, it was dust. Okay, there's no integrity. You see the back side of this paper, it's not even bonded, okay? What do, you, what do you do with a mess like this, right? Two options. One is expansion foam. The second option, you guessed it, mud and paper tape. Now, let's patch this first, okay? Uh, the secret here is to fill it with compound, even if it doesn't want to be. Okay? It's gonna be a big, chunky bubble. What we're gonna do is we're gonna start by adding paper just to the side. Give it a little bit of support on both sides. Okay, here we go. Don't overlap the paper yet. Okay. I'm gonna give it just a little bit of support. Now, remember the motto of doing drywall work is to fill in gaps, not to mud over bumps, right? So we're going to make everything nice and wet and we're gonna see where it sags, right here, okay? Now I'm gonna push the paper up and expose the extra mud and remove it. Okay, now when I clean, I should have a, a dent. Okay, so clean knife. I'm not getting any more material out of the way. Now it's perfect time to add another piece of paper here. Oh, I got a lot of mud on that paper. There we go. Now we're going to go over top, paper over paper. Okay. Now, 
We're going to use a bit of pressure and create a bump, something I can fill. But I don't want to fill that, fill that today. I want to let all that set up. And then tomorrow when I come back, I'm going to have a smooth ceiling with a gap that needs to be filled. Okay? It'll be rock solid. Not a problem at all. Next day I come, I'm just going to treat that like a butt joint that's already been taped. Piece of cake. Now, of course, let's get on with it. Oh, yeah. Watch this. If you have a hawk and you're applying mud on the ceiling, you got something to catch your mud. Keep your floors clean. That primer sealer is pretty much dry now. I'm not going to get too worried about it. Oh, nice catch. Oh. Oh. Uh, for those who are into games, <laughs> trying to work an entire day on a ceiling without getting mud on the floor. That's fun. My God, eh? Here we are. Uh, let's get right over there. Always paper over paper. Okay. Here we go. <clears throat> when you're doing your taping, you can use the hawk to hold the paper and stretch it. Okay? It's like having an extra hand and it never gets dirty. Okay. Now, the reason I got wrinkles here is my paper tape is on an angle. It's going on a bend. My tape is on a bender. That's awesome. All right, here we go. And stretch that this way. Clean that up a little bit. And of course, always finish with a bit of moisture. Oh, I failed miserably and something hit the ground. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Remember, there are millions of people out there that do drywall work that are never around the house weeks, months, years afterwards to see the result of their work. They don't get to see all the cracks they cause by cutting corners. All the little issues that are, are developing with their nail pops because they didn't pay enough attention to the project. Okay? And they think they know what they're doing. Knowing skills like this, when you're working on your own house, means that you can make things perfect every single time and that you can have confidence. The rule is really this. When you're doing your mudding, make sure that you always have paper on paper. Okay? Be happy with everything that you do. Don't cover over screw holes with a mountain of mud. You're filling a hole. You won't get nail pops if you do everything right. You won't get cracks if you do it all right. Just take your time. Be happy with every step that you do. You can be the best taper in your neighborhood. Cheers. And here we go, guys. We're finishing the video where we started. Back to this plug. Right? We foamed it in. Take a brand new awful blade. Okay? Trim it flush. Right? Oof. Hoo -hoo. There we go. That's perfect. Now, here's the thing. If you filled it up well, that acts as an adhesive between the box and the drywall. Okay? There is no actual need for paper tape here. I know, that might blow your mind. All right? And there might not be a need to do any mud work at all. If you want, you can always check your receptacle, your plug, and see if it's necessary. But if you're going to put mud on, watch this. You've got to put mud around the entire thing at the same thickness. Okay? Remember, the cover plate is a rectangle. You can't just mud one side. If you're ever repairing anything around a box, don't just put mud on one side or tape one side. You have to do the whole circle. You have to make the entire surface that that plug is going to go on the same depth. Because if, if all I do is fill up this side with compound, I put on that plug, I'm going to have a huge gap along the top of that box. And it's just going to scream. All right, so remember the goal here is smooth all the way around. Now, if you have a small space, all you need is this. This is a sanding sponge. It's a medium grit. You can get it off the shelf at the Home Depot. And it has an angle on it. And that's designed for your inside corners, OK? You can take the wide piece of this, and you can get that nice 
dusty look. That's a hard edge. That's a sanded edge. It's soft and fuzzy like clouds, okay? That's what you're aiming for. Once you get that, everything in the middle, you're just changing the texture to be consistent. That's officially sanded. Ha <laughs> ha, nice and easy. It doesn't matter how big your room is or how small it is. You gotta be able to do an inside corner. Number one mistake people make is they turn this around, they shove it square in the corner. Well, that's a 90, that's a square, and they go sand like this. And what they end up getting is a ridge right here. And they put a groove in that. Now you go prime that and you go ready to paint. You gotta fix all that. And I'm gonna have to fix that now too. But here's the deal. If you take your sponge, put it in the corner like that on the angle, and then you open it up a little bit. Now you're sanding the whole width of this mud and you're not grooving this side of the wall and you're just sharpening up that edge, okay? There we go, now that side is done. Again, get that nice and foggy like that little cloudy look, you're good to go. And you can do your whole room with one sponge. It's gonna last like a bathroom reno or something like that. Now if you're doing a bigger space and ceilings, you might wanna get something like this. Telescopic pole, it's a Radius 360, or Richard makes one. There's a few different manufacturers. I don't really care. They all do the same thing, the hook and loop, and you can get a little screen or sandpaper on there, and you can flip it upside down, put it on the ceiling, and you can sand this way. Okay, same thing. Get that nice cloudy look, change the texture of the mud, and that'll help make this a much faster job. That way you're not walking around with a sanding sponge right in front of your face, up in the ceiling, covering yourself full of dust, and that's another option. Now in all these cases, you're gonna need one more thing. So if you're using any kind of traditional sanding tools, you're gonna need this, okay? It's a floor sweeping compound, and what we're gonna do with this is demonstrate the value of it here, okay? Yep, it's still red. Years back, we had a company here in Ottawa that actually made compound like this, and it was green. There we go. Bunch of drywall dust in the corner. When you're done, you simply throw this in the corner, and you can sweep it, and it eats the dust. It won't kick it up in the air, and that'll help keep your dust down. Okay, but the reality is when you're dealing with these situations, it's already too late because you've added so much dust to your house and it's all over the place. So here's what you need to do to prevent dust from going through your house driving you crazy. First thing you've gotta do is you gotta turn off your furnace or your air conditioning or anything else that's like got a blower fan, okay? Set up a zip wall over the entrance to the room and then put a window or a fan with ducting to exit the basement or the room that you're working in, okay? That creates negative pressure so all the dust in the air gets sucked out of the window into the outside and out there nobody cares. But if you're doing a huge room, Room like this, which is 1,700 square feet, you're gonna wanna get one of these bad boys. Now this is a professional tool, but it's not expensive. I just picked this one up on Amazon, 600 bucks, and then whoa, you might say, Jeff, that's expensive. If you've ever sanded a huge drywall project like a basement and it takes almost all day, and then you have to hire cleaners to come clean your house, they're gonna charge you more than 600 bucks. <laughs> so, might wanna consider this. This is just a battery powered tool, which means the following. You can use your existing batteries from all your dwell tools. You hook up a vacuum to it, done. And while you're buying this, you can buy the pads at the same time. They sell these in packs of like 20 or 40. They come anywhere from 40 to 400 grit. Might I recommend that you start with the 400 while you're getting used to a tool for the first time. And because it's variable speed, turn the speed way down to one. Get started. I'm using 240 because that's what I like to sand my drywall with. And I'm using it on number seven because I'm comfortable with it. <laughs> so here we go. We're gonna give you a little demonstration. To start it, push the button. All right. There we go. Two more little things I should mention. Tool that comes without batteries also doesn't have the adapter for the vacuum. So they sell that on Amazon as well. Make sure you grab one if you buy the tool. And I know it's 600 bucks, but here's the deal. You can use it and have it as a, I used it once and sell it again on Kijiji. And you can get 450 or 500 for it, no problem. And that way it only costs you 100 bucks to sand your whole basement. You don't have to hire somebody. You don't have to hire a cleaner. You can do it yourself and you can do it for about 100 bucks. Now, because I'm working overhead, I'm using a tiny little battery. And this isn't gonna last very long. It's only gonna get 20, maybe 30 minutes out of it. That's fine, I've got more on the charger. Here's the nuance. As long as your handle is close to the ceiling, it works really evenly because it's spinning, okay? And it pivots on ahead. So you wanna keep it as close to the ceiling as you can. As soon as you get to like this, now you're putting pressure on either that side or that side. There's no option. You're gonna be putting pressure and it becomes a gouging wheel. And you're like, and you're just belt sand part of the ceiling off. That's bad. Just remember, keep your pole close to the surface that you're working on instead of like this. Because if you're straight off of it, it's just gonna run you right off the ladder. That's about all there is to it. Now, the coolest thing about this is, I would say over 90% of, of the dust is trapped by the vacuum. Now, I've got a vacuum bag and a HEPA filter vacuum set up, so I'm gonna be good to go. Now, I'm gonna just do a quick time lapse on this thing and show you how easy this is to get done. This is very, very satisfying because I'll tell you, once you learn how to mud and then you get a proper sanding tool like this, you're gonna love drywall, just like I do. 
Now the sanding machine doesn't get right inside the corners, so you're still going to have to use the blue sponge. You are going to expose screw heads that are sticking out too far. That's okay. That's what the prime check is for. Just tighten up any screw head that's sticking out and use 45 minute compound to patch that up. Then you can prime and do your prime check and you'll be good to go. The darn thing is heavy. <laughs> There's no two ways around it. It is work. The secret to success here is to keep switching from one low hand and one high hand above your heart because you can only hold that machine above your heart for so long before your arm tires because you're pumping the blood up above the heart. As long as you keep switching your hands, you'll be able to get the job done in no time at all. Uh, remember, let the machine do the work. It's not about you pushing the sander into the ceiling. All you're doing is holding it so that you're making positive contact. It is a vacuum, so it'll help hold itself against the ceiling. Your job is just to put it in the right position. It's not your job to physically be applying any pressure. So just take it easy, let the machine do the work, and enjoy drywall, finally for the first time in your life. Now you can see, guys, right here, I got little imperfections from when I actually did my mud. There is a law in, in drywall, and here's the law. We are simply taking off ridges. We are not trying to sand out grooves into a longer space. Imperfections are imperfections. That's what prime check is for. What I'm looking at here, all these little imperfections, most of those go away with a simple swipe of the brush. Those are the ones that you're not gonna get with the machine. And that's gonna create some dust that's gonna fall to the ground. That's why you need the red dust. Other than that, you're good. Behind me, I'm in the basement. I'm about to do a drywall project. I gotta do primer. You can't just paint right over drywall. So, boom. Drywall primer. Read the fine print. If the word drywall doesn't come before the word primer, you can't use it on new drywall. Now there's a lot of companies out there that are selling a PVA drywall primer. PVA makes it sound technical and makes it sound important, but it's junk. All drywall primer is drywall primer, it's all PVA. You can spend $15 a gallon. This is a two gallon jug, so it's 31. You can spend 15 bucks, or you can spend up to $45 for PVA drywall in the same store. It's just drywall. Really what you're looking for here is a primer sealer. You want a paint that hits the drywall, and sucks right inside. Seals it up, creates a nice solid white surface so that you can find out if there's imperfections. That's what this is. Keep it simple, keep it 15 bucks. No need to spend a whole lot of money on that. There are cheaper primers than this as well. They are generally much more water than paint, have a very low solid count so that you don't get a good white finish. Stay away from it. You get what you pay for when it comes to this stuff. 15 bucks is a good place to aim. And don't forget, I'm from Canada. A lot of people don't know that. Down in the States, I'm sure there's a better price available for you. Three inch brush, roller, microfiber sleeve, okay? You cut and roll primer, and you can use your short extension pull or your long extension pull. And when you're doing drywall paint, especially, you wanna use lots of pressure when you're painting, okay? You wanna really push that paint into the paper. That's a great technique, okay? Now there is one more option, and that's what we're gonna do here today. I got myself a new toy. Now this is a high volume, low pressure. It's a paint machine, and it sprays, and it doesn't have air, okay? So it's an airless spraying machine, and we are going to do this whole basement right now. In this video, we're gonna prime it. We're gonna show you how to use this machine, because yes, I bought it, because I got a bunch of projects coming up. I'm gonna use a machine. There's no sense in me renting anymore, and yeah, you can go down to your local Home Depot, and you can rent a paint machine just like this for your next project, so you don't have to cut and roll, all right? Remember, on this channel, we're gonna give you more than one option. There's no such thing as only one way to do anything. There's many ways. It all depends on your skills, your talent, your budget, how much easier and how much pain you want to go through. But I bought this to get this project finished because we got another project waiting for us down south. We can't wait to sink our teeth into and it's going to involve a lot of painting as well. So this just makes good sense for me at this time. I'm going to travel with it with my trailer and the RV. Woo, here we go. Now let's just clean this all up. We'll jump in to show you how to use this machine because there are tips and tricks and techniques, especially when you're getting started. If you've never used it before, when you're done this video, you'll know how to use this for sure. And we'll have finished priming our basement. All right, well, here's my little spot here to grab a hold of this man. There we go, just cut that loose. Just rip right off. Loving it. All right. Now, the way you set up your paint sprayer is simple. When you buy it, you connect the nose. This is your primer, which basically, it's a fancy word for in the open position, it directs all the paint into the pump itself. And then when you close it, it fills the line to the gun. If you've ever primed a well water or lake water at the cottage, that's what that is. There we go. Now, generally speaking, mm, that's right, it's a messy business, isn't it? Here we go. If you have a five liter pail, you can actually hook it right on. We're gonna turn on the switch over here. I'm gonna fill the pump. Fill this, 
here we go. Now everything's filled. A couple of secrets to working with the gun. I haven't even adjusted my pressure yet. I think I'm gonna try going a little bit higher, get a little bit more paint coming out of here. It seems to come off with just a little bit soft. There's a dial on the side. Okay, you can adjust it according to the type of paint, the kind of finish you're looking for. If it starts to get drippy and cloggy, you can turn this around and whew, blows it out, reverses the tip. Now, not to worry, we can say on that later. You wanna be about 12 inches from the wall. You wanna be perpendicular to the wall. So if you spray like this, you're gonna get a high concentration and then fading out. And if you go up and down like this, you're gonna get different concentrations of paint again. So the secret here is to have the wire and your gun so that you're working 12 inches out. Okay, and then you wanna point the gun on the lead edge of your paint. And it gives you a nice overlap. Oh yeah, this is working well now, okay. And you can see the benefit of doing this because, hey, that's quick. It's a lot easier than using a brush and roller. Now, especially when you get to the ceiling parts, you can hold this right upside down, that's fine. And you can actually pivot this and then tighten this back up again. So now I can paint this way. Always let go of the handle before you stop moving. Otherwise, you'll just be spraying in one spot. That's about it for the lesson, okay? Really kind of simple. Wow. That's amazing. Overall, I was really happy with this. I turned it up to pretty much maximum pressure. I was able to make a nice, clean, smooth sweep at about 14 inches. Didn't have to do too much overlay. It's a really good full coat. It took two gallons to do the space, which I would have expected if I was using a brush and roller. I actually find that spraying is better than rolling when it comes to filling in all the hairline scratches that are in the drywall surface. It seems to fill it up a lot more even. This is probably because we're not using the roller and pushing the paint through the surface of the paper. And I think overall, it gives you a better finish. All right, here we go, guys. Prime check time. It needs another five or 10 minutes. When you spray, give it about an hour to set up and dry, okay? We're a little advanced on here, but that's because I'm going to try to send Max home early today. Prime checking. Hawk, four-inch knife. We're not going to put this in a pail and add water and mix it. We're just going to throw it on the hawk, and we're just going to play with it. This is like being a kid. We get to play with our mud. And by whipping it up like this, you're going to make it creamy smooth enough for what we're doing. Because we're not using a four by 10 and we're not filling big gaps, that's fine to avoid air pockets. You'll notice it's extremely kind of chocolatey because I'm using beige. When you buy in your mud, make sure for your prime check you use the beige. Here's why. I can see that. Tomorrow, when that come back here to prime again, I have to prime my touch-ups. I'm gonna pull out the sprayer. I'm gonna look for all my beige spots. Give them a quick shot after I sand, and I can be 100% confident that all of my prime check is completed. If I use regular white compound, when it dries, I'm not gonna see it on the wall. I run the chance of missing it. Remember, I'm in a basement, I don't have a lot of natural light. If I have a spot on the ceiling that I prime check, and I don't sand it, and I forget to prime it, well, then I'm gonna paint my ceilings, and then I'm gonna have a great big flat spot where it's gonna shine through, and it's gonna drive me crazy because then I have to start right back all over again to sealing it and then two more coats drive you nuts, right? So don't do it. Use the beige mud. Make sure you find all your imperfections, okay? The rule of life is this. If you're standing six feet away and you can't see it, it doesn't exist. So don't go walking around like this looking for problems unless you're like me. And then that's what I like to do. I like to grab my lamp, stick it right up against the wall. And now I can see all the imperfections. But you know, honestly, between that sander not a bad day's work. So this is an airless sprayer. This is the power switch, on off. And nothing happens if everything is fully charged and pressurized, okay? Now, right here is the PSI, how much pressure you're putting on. And this is the one thing that you can adjust, right? You start it here, you can go all the way up here. I was sort of in the middle-ish, okay? I found that when I'm using flat paint for my ceilings to prime, that was the perfect location. We're gonna have to test the ceiling paint because it's a different mixture. This is your priming switch. When you lift it up, it fills the machine full of paint. And if it's full of paint, then it starts to push it back into the pail. Now it's pressurized. And when it's down, it fills the line. So if you're just starting out and you haven't got any paint anywhere yet, you lift this up, you fill this machine, and then you fill, drop it to fill the line, okay? That's all it is. When you're working and you run out of paint, the machine will go, 
Ah, I'll start making all that crazy noise. All that means is, hey, there's no more paint in the pump. So you come over, you turn it off, you change, you add some more paint to the bucket, turn it back on again, and lift the switch for a few seconds, and then drop it. Everything will be pressurized. Not a problem. Don't be scared. Nothing bad has happened to the machine. It's just the pump going, I don't have any paint. Now, we got a bunch of hose, and then we have a sprayer. The sprayer has a tip. Here's my arrow, and that's to the direction of the paint. And if you're working away, and you start to get spattering and clogging on the wall, you just turn it around the other way, and now you've made the small part of the hole on the inside of the, and the big hole on the outside, and you just clean it out. Okay, and then you can turn it around, and now you got full spray. You can see that. There's not a lot of adjusting going on here. You can have a spray pattern in two different directions. So you can go left or right, or you can go up and down, and that's about it. That's all you need to know to use this machine. It's nice and simple. Now, I just finished doing all of the priming on all of the prime check, and then spot priming all of the, my prime check. So this is drywall primer. It's not what I want to use to paint the ceiling. It is a flat paint, so I'm not going to go through the process of washing the machine out. I'm just going to switch over the paint. And here we go. Take it off the hook. This is the paint we're going to use. And because I'm trying to be sensitive to the fact that you guys mostly are shopping at the box stores, if you're going to go to Home Depot to rent the machine, you're probably going to go to Home Depot to buy the paint. This is Glidden paint. This is what we have here in Canada. I have no idea what's on the shelf at Home Depot in the United States. Okay, but there will be a product like this, I'm sure of it. Now, here's the deal. This particular product starts off pink and dries white. So you can see what you've painted, which is a huge benefit because the last thing we wanna do is put so much paint on the ceiling that it's drippy. You wanna get just enough coverage that you get a great finish and it's not drippy. What we're gonna do is we're not gonna freak out about a little bit of flat paint mixing with the ceiling paint. And I'm just gonna remove that, slide this over, kerplunk, all right? Now, what I am going to do is I'm going to turn my nozzle around and I'm going to paint into this bucket to empty the pump and the line of the old paint before I start spraying the ceiling. Let it catch up a little bit here. Notice that that sound is very normal and don't be freaked out by it. There we go. Now we got ceiling paint coming into the mix. That's great. I'm gonna get rid of this. All right, now I'm just gonna do a spray pattern test here real quick. Get familiar with the machine. All right, so when I'm holding it like this, the gap is left to right. That's the way it sprays, because it sprays a pretty wide beam. Uh, 12 inches off the wall, you end up with about a 12 inch wide spray. So here we go, we're gonna test the spray. What we're looking for is one of two things. One, is it coming out so fast that it's getting runny? Two, is it consistent across the spray pattern? If there's a gap in the spray pattern, right here and right here, then what that means is you don't have enough pressure. And you'll know to just go over the dial and turn it up a little bit. Let's check this out. Wow, that looks really good. Let's just for fun, try this with really low pressure. We'll see if it changes anything. Okay, you see this? There's actually a little line. We're gonna increase the pressure and get rid of that problem. So here's really low pressure. You can see it now, right? That's what we're talking about. We don't wanna have that. Might I suggest, grab yourself a piece of drywall while you're picking up your equipment so you got somewhere to test this. <laughs> That's a very consistent spray. What you want to do is when you're spraying, you start off, this is pretty much where you want your ceiling to be, okay? And this will be on the wall. And then the second line, you want to line your machine up right off the edge of that spray. And that'll give you perfect coverage over time. Now that we got that sorted out, we understand our machine, we got our color, we know we got our pattern. Let's get rid of this. All right, now before we can go and paint, this is a new construction. So I have drywall, I've got primer, I've got patching, I've got more paint, now I've got a sand. Always sand in between coats is very important. It's the difference between a rough surface like this and this smooth as a baby's bum. I'm gonna just use this disc sander here. When you're sanding in between coats, it doesn't require a lot of work. Just a single pass will smooth everything out. Any dust that collected on the ceiling during my process will be removed. And there's no need for me to collect the dust. I don't have to wipe it off or clean it up. It's painted dust and it'll fall straight to the ground. So I just finished sanding my ceiling, sorry. No need for heavy sanding equipment. I don't have to pull out my dustless vacuum sander for this. Just gotta make sure you don't fall off your ladder. 
that's enough to get started. Let's start spraying our ceiling. So just a couple of rules when using this machine. For the purpose of your own protection at home, I would suggest safety glasses. Probably wear a mask. There is a little bit of an overspray on this. It just kind of like dust raining out of the sky. Generally speaking, if you stay about 12 inches from the wall, you get best result. You want to be square to the wall, perpendicular. If this is the wall, you want to be straight off of it. If I start spraying on angles, I get heavy concentration up near the top and then weak concentration down here. I'll be very inconsistent and I'll get drip lines at the top of my spray. If I spray this way, it's the same problem. So you want to try to stay square to the wall or square to the ceiling as you paint, okay? And the only other thing that I'm going to suggest you might want to know, always release the pressure when you finish a run. Don't just keep spraying like you see the pros doing. It takes a lot of experience to get to that level where you're going to be comfortable with your result. All right, here we go. So we're going to be painting the, this bulkhead, the face of it, and the ceiling. So let's just get started. Okay, now it's one coat coverage. We're not doing this twice. And if you're in a room where, the, let's say there's a big window here, you wanna make sure you're spraying across the window so when the light comes in, you don't have any risk of any minor amounts of discrepancy in, in the texture because of the amount of volume of paint. That's really the only thing to watch out for. Here we go, we're gonna be spraying. That's it, that's not that difficult. That's all you gotta do, slow and easy. If you wanna go faster, increase your pressure. Just be careful you're not getting blobs and globs, okay? Time is money, honey. And if you can get it done faster and get the same result, there's nothing wrong with that. So whenever you're doing a floor, obviously, the rule number one is preparation, preparation, preparation. Love using a sweeping compound, especially a new construction. It absolutely eats the dust. And so I like to sweep the perimeter, because at this point, I've just finished my sanding, my priming, painted my ceilings after doing all my touch-up repairs. So there's definitely drywall compound all around here. Even when you use a vacuum sander like we did in the video before this, you can check that out. We'll put the description in the video link. We're always using a sponge on inside and outside corners. It's always a trail of dust all around the perimeter of the room. We don't want to just vacuum that up because it kills your vacuum filter really quick. So if you use a sweeping compound, you can clean it up, put it in a bag and get rid of it that way. Then when we're done, I can grab the vacuum. Broom clean may be good at the job site at the end of the day, but it's not good before flooring. Got a vacuum. As you can see, there's a huge difference between vacuumed and not vacuumed, okay? If you just install flooring over the dusty floor that you have, every time someone takes a step, there's gonna be a certain level of deflection, which is gonna displace air. It's gonna come up around the perimeter that you leave a gap and right into the room, and you're gonna have a filthy space to live in for years. I know, it's 2,000 square feet. That's gonna take 2,000 seconds. <laughs> It's not that bad, maybe an hour to clean up. And then we're gonna be ready to start putting down our line and getting this floor installed. So what I got is I got a 35 foot long wall. That can be a real challenge. And I've got stairs coming right off the far end. When you come off the stairs and into this room, you're gonna see all 35 feet of this flooring coming in this long direction. Remember, one of the rules of laying flooring is you want your plank installed in the same direction as the longest wall. This makes sense, so 35 feet, we're gonna go this way. Since you're gonna be able to look right down that line and it's pre-finished flooring, there will be a tiny little groove here. Anybody in the world will be able to look at that line and say, yes, it's straight or no, it's not. So step number one, make sure you're making a straight line. The process for getting a straight line is really quite simple, but it involves patience. You can't just start and finish this project in the same day. So today we're gonna to start our starter row. We're gonna let that sit overnight and then we're gonna build up and finish this flooring over the next couple days. So let's take a look at what we need to do this. I like to organize myself when I'm doing flooring by taking my product, getting it on the floor next to where I'm working. The boxes are upside down, it's easy to open, it's easy to grab product. I can just reach over and grab one. They come various sizes, so I always like to make sure that I've got lots of product on the floor. I also have a clean space to work. One other tip I wanted to show you, because we're on a subfloor here and we use tap cons, taking a spray paint, making a white spot, wherever the tap cons are. Because when I'm coming across and I'm nailing my floor, if I'm right here with the floor and I see that white spot, I know not to put a staple there. I don't want my staple hitting that tap con and not getting deep down buried in the wood because then I'm gonna have to pry it out. It's gonna damage the board. That becomes garbage. It's a huge waste of time. So that's just my little cheat, okay? Because we are on a subfloor in a basement. It's tap con in. Now, the other thing is, if you're not watching the whole series, we've been renovating this whole basement from the beginning. Let me just show you the subfloor system. Okay, we're using an insulated panel. 
three quarter inch insulation. We got a thermal break on the entire floor. 5 8 OSB tongue and groove screwed to the floor. That's thick enough and established enough that I can install hardwood right on top of it. No problem at all, okay? So this is what we're doing. I know vinyl is all the rage because it's cheap. This is a lifetime floor. And because of the construction and the nature of the position of this particular house, we're so high up on a hill and it was built on sand. It's got all of the bells and whistles for exterior waterproofing. We aren't expecting to ever have a moisture problem here, no matter how hard mother nature tries. We're good putting wood in the basement and we're just gonna show you how, first of all, to get your first line. The first line's the key. Now we're gonna be using a compressor and a rented tool today. I've got a DeWalt hardwood floor nailer here. This is rental from Home Depot. I rented it for the week. It's very affordable. With any luck, I only need it for a few days and I can save a few bucks, but no big deal. Let's just start off right here. This is the wall that was pre-built when we got to this project and it's separated and it's under a steel beam. And so there's a really good chance that it's somewhat straight because <laughs> it's straight up top, right? The first thing we gotta do is find out, did they use a level? Is the bottom straight or is it all wonky? Turns out that when we check this out, we threw a few pieces of wood up against the wall and I dropped my laser line. I'm touching the front of that nosing on this pretty consistently. So let's just try to make this perfect. Right there. I want to create a line that I can install this edge right here, touching the green, right like that, all the way down the whole room. So I have to move back a little bit. This is a real picky issue. <clears throat> Pull back just a tad. Okay, now we're gonna go for a walk to each end and we're gonna check this out. There we go. I'm tied to the wall and I'm right on the nosing. That's fantastic. Same down there. We'll go to the other end. I've got a little extra space here. I got maybe a quarter inch here. Quarter, 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 and then I'm right on that, I'm tight. So this is the piece, is the one that's gonna cause me the most issue. The wall's also gotta work, but I can work with that green line. Fantastic, all right. The secret to starting is making sure, knowing your end. I am using the same baseboard trim that they used upstairs in the whole house, and it's only half inch thick material. It's not three quarter, so I don't have a lot of mercy. Because of the nature of a basement, I don't have to worry about expansion and contraction of the wood down here. It's gonna be the same temperature year round. Sometimes the air might be a little drier like it is now, but it's also been climatizing for about a week in the other room. So I am going to give myself just a little bit more space off the wall. I'm gonna pull back my laser another eighth of an inch. That'll give me enough room to have a little bit of expansion space. But remember with flooring, your expansion usually happens in the same direction as the length of the board, not the width. So it's not gonna swell wider than five. It's gonna grow in length in most cases. So we don't have to be too picky. So I'm just gonna grab this laser, pull it back another, just a hair, and then I'll straighten that line out. Okay, there we go. There we go, now I'm gonna install to that. Yeah, you guessed it. The one thing that I hate to do is use construction adhesive on a job site when there's finished flooring around. What you need to do is manage yourself really well here. We have ram board stair risers and runners upstairs and site protection. We did a whole video about how to set up your job because you gotta protect yourself. This product right here, let me just show you the label. I called up the company one day this is years back. And I said, what do I use to remove dried PL Premium off of someone's hardwood floor? And the lady on the other end of the phone from PL Premium, Lepage, said, there is nothing on earth that will remove it. The only thing you can do is put in a new floor for them, sweetheart. She told me that if I got to it within a couple of hours, I could have used mineral spirits, but this is the only product that they sell that they can't clean off after the fact. If we're gonna use it, we gotta have a system. Best case scenario is two people doing this, okay? One person's using the glue, and the other person's on the clean side of the house. And then when the person clean it, do, using the glue is done, they go to the stairs, they take their shoes off, they leave them in the room, and they go upstairs where they brought a second pair of shoes. This is the kind of thing you want job site shoes. You just cannot take any chances. So, I'm gonna need adhesive, the first five inches, because I can't use nails from the hardwood. I always set it on cardboard. I can't use this nailer right out of the gate. It fires a staple, which is great. And once we get running, it'll be great, but I can't use this. It's not that I can't up against the wall. I can get it up against the wall and I can pound this thing and fire, but I can't get anything on a straight line using this to start. So today it's all about creating my line. That is gonna be by using the longest pieces that we can, not the shortest. We're gonna set them in the glue. Bam, installed. Here we go. So we're just gonna get organized, take some adhesive, set our flooring in place. So that tomorrow, when we come back, all of that is dried and bonded, which is why we had to take the time to sweep and vacuum. Okay. Now this particular mallet has got a, like a rubber top. So you can use it to pound things left and right which is great. 
And we've got some time to work with this, right? Just gonna show you. We'll get a couple rows going here. We'll confirm that our line is good. Again, as many of the longer boards as we can to start with. Time for step two. I'm gonna be using inch and a quarter, 16 gauge nailer. This is not an 18, this is 16. 18 gauge nails are too thin for this. Hardwood, you'll find a lot of times it'll just bounce back, it won't penetrate, it'll erase surface, it'll drive you nuts. Really what we wanna do is start at the very end here. We're gonna slide all this together. We want that green line right on this crack. Okay, I'm not there yet. Bam. I'm gonna create a pivot point here for my green line. Now the nature of these power tools means I'm not gonna get that nail within a half an inch. I'm gonna have it showing. So I wanna make sure that I have it pushed down hard, great contact, straight up and down, nothing on an angle. I don't want the head to stick out after I'm done because I can always add a little wax putty to it to fix it afterwards. Now, here's my green spot, right? I move my wood till I'm right on that groove. And then we fire another nail. Okay, that's a dent that can be filled, perfect. Now I'm not over nailing because it is gonna be in the surface of the room, but I gotta make sure that that's perfect. Now that that's done, I can actually tap. And the funny thing is about these hammers that come with these nailers, when it's on the ground and it makes contact, it always makes contact on an angle. So even if you're hitting an end of this wood that doesn't have a tongue, it's never really striking the surface of the wood. It's always hitting underneath, okay? That's designed like that on purpose so you don't damage your wood during install. I can give it a little love tap, set it in the glue, now I do have the ability to fire a nail down here. So I'm gonna take that opportunity. But now I'm just gonna work my way all the way up to the other end of this room, doing both rows together on that green line and I'm not gonna to touch my laser. That's the key. As long as you don't touch the laser, we're good to go. solving right because this is the most difficult part of the room if you're wondering how we cut around the post it's as easy as marking and using a jigsaw but this transition is probably the most difficult and most obvious issue you're gonna have with your flooring because we're doing the same layout as we did upstairs they've got a piece at the threshold of the main room into their dining room and the hardwood does this okay changes direction perpendicular on the transition from the room. And that's great. So we're gonna do the same thing. Uh, I like continuity in a house. If you do things different in different levels, people pick up on this. Now we have cut this on a 45 in anticipation that this wall is installed on a 45 degree and it's pretty close, but of course nothing's perfect and it won't be in your house either. So here's how we're gonna solve that problem. Now you'll notice we've got a couple of splits. So we're gonna use a 240 sand grit. Hey. And that's it, and I'll tell you why. Because I'm gonna be butting this up against a groove finish, all right? And I'll give you an idea what that looks like. There we go. Now, you can see a little split. That's from the sawtooth, not an issue. We do have wax and we have markers after the fact to touch up imperfections like this. But the one thing we have to try to avoid here is this, the angle is leaving gaps on every piece of wood. This is not professional. Now, if this was site finish flooring, uh, and it's just bare wood. You can sand it down, you can take your sawdust, you can mix it with glue, you can scrape it in and you can fill it and sand it and then stain it. That's great, but we're dealing with pre-finish. So what we have to deal with is a higher degree of difficulty when it comes to solving problems like this. We have a really unique door here because we have two walls. Okay, here we go. I would rather not have my transition sticking up past the jam on either side. Over here, let's just check this 
Yeah, that's actually a perfect size. And it gives me a little bit of wiggle room because I am adding a casing on each side as well. So when I think about it that way, I've got a half an inch wiggle room on each side that I can put these two rows. Now, I've got a finished jam here. I've got to get rid of this tongue on this board because I don't want to have a gap, right? So let's do that. Here we are. Boom. Okay, now, this one I'm going to end up cutting that off as well. Because I'm a little bit weird, I'm probably going to notch out both sides of this and then slide it so that my wood goes inside the door just because the door doesn't go all the way to the ground and even in the closed position you can still see that gap it's a nice touch if you got a pocket door take the time to make that notch and slide the fresh wood a good inch inch and a half inside your pocket door hole how do we figure out jeff what the angle is going to be here how do we make it perfect so we're going to start with our wood right off the jam i'm going to put these two together and use it like a long slide ruler and put it off the side over the other now because of the tongue i'm about a quarter of an inch maybe closer to an eighth exposed. All right, so my angle isn't really true. In truth, that would better represent the angle because that represents the thickness of the tongue. We're gonna come over here, put our piece in, and then we're gonna love tap it over and see if we're gonna have it open up on us. Yeah, you see me making contact here? There it is, there's my contact and there's a gap. Now, we don't want that. So, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna keep on tapping this until the gap closes, and I'm gonna push this board into the door frame area. Still not quite there, but I'm making contact with the wall. What I'm gonna do, is I'm gonna take a second board with the same cut, same angle, and I'm gonna use it to determine my resting space as soon as that gap disappears. Okay, now my gap is gone. And that looks like that's where I'm gonna to have to start. That's fascinating, eh? You'll notice when there's no glue, no nails yet. We really wanna take this, be patient. I'm gonna use my ruler just to extend my straight line so when I mark this piece of wood, I'm marking what I'm gonna cut, okay? And there's my spot right there. And I wanna cut the same distance that that is. Okay. Bam. Now, here's the fun part. Because I'm on an angle, the same distance that I, I measured here off, I have to then go over and actually cut there. It's a law of triangles. Because it's sliding that way, it's going to go the same amount that way as it is going up. So we're going to mark there, and we're going to notch that. And you're going to be like, Jeff, this is an awful lot of work to just to get started on making this transition. The rest of this goes really quick, trust me. It's all about getting this right line established. And then we're going to go through the procedure, and I'll show you how to use all the tools. Now let's see if I know what the hell I'm talking about. This is just a test again. Make sure that, that my cut is right. <laughs> yeah, I am really pleased with that. All right, so now it's time for installation. Now we got all of our materials. We can obliterate this and just get to work. One thing I wanna do, I'm gonna want glue. Because we are working with tongue and groove, and traditionally the boards come with tongues on two sides and grooves on two sides. Because I've got a flesh cut here on the end, I don't have anything joining these two pieces of wood together. So what I have to rely on is adhesive. And we're gonna be using PL Premium, just like we did when we started. This is the stuff that's dangerous and makes a hell of a mess of your house. We're gonna put a bead on both. We just wanna manage where the tip is because it does leak sometimes, all right? We're gonna set that in the glue just so that both of these pieces of wood are gonna be glued at that point of contact. Okay, I'm gonna put another little strip of glue here. And before I put that board in, we're gonna introduce you to the nailer. Nails go in from the top and you get little tracks like this. They come in uh, one and a half and two inch, pretty standard just about anywhere. 
put your hose pressure uh, 120 to 150. 120 is better for engineered wood. 150 is better if it's solid wood. And then you just use this rubber mallet to hit the plunger. Bam. All right, nice and easy. Now the thing about this mallet is the end is not cut on a 90. It's intentionally on like a 75 degree angle so that when it's on the ground and you run into the wood, you are intentionally hitting the underneath. I'll show you here on the shorter piece. Okay, whenever you're hitting the wood on these short angles, the metal is never actually coming in contact with the top surface. It's really hard to see on camera, but if I was to hit it like this, I would damage my finish. But as long as I keep it flush, I can hit all day long because I'm hitting the bottom piece of the wood. That's what that's designed to do. You want to put a nail in here, six to eight inches. Okay. And like we talked about earlier, the wider the plank, the more adhesive you got to use in your installation. So make sure you check the manufacturer's specs before you go and stick your floor down. Is this a piece I was putting in? Yeah. All right, let me just. All right. If your tongue and groove isn't going together nicely, in most cases, it's because you have a bump or a warp in the floor, okay, and your tongue and groove isn't lining up. Just step on it. You can manipulate the wood. There we go, nice and easy, okay. Oh, Jesus, Max. What? I don't think I had it in the right spot. All right, well, here we are. Daddy screwed up. I didn't put this all the way over, so I'm actually not lined up. And if I just cheat and pull this nice and flush, no, my angle's messed up. We've already established my angle's way over here. So, all right, here's how you lift it up. There really is no two ways around it. Staple goes in on a 45 degree angle. You gotta pry that staple out. You wanna be gentle with it because you won't wanna damage any of the edges, okay? Now this piece of wood has got staples in it. It's garbage. It's okay if you hurt it. Here we go. Nice and easy. You can see why this is gonna keep it from squeaking, right? I mean, that's awesome. Unfortunately, so is the one damage that I put my beautiful cut into with the jigsaw. When you lift the front, it slides out on the same angle that the nails are put into. So you can generally remove these boards without damaging anything else. But it's also got adhesive on it now, so we gotta be careful not to get that on the floor. Okay, now, gotta do this again. <laughs> okay, here we go again. All right. That is more my style. Okay. The slower you go, the cleaner the cut. Don't be afraid to be patient. And don't try to line it up so you're cutting right off the corner. This is not the time to worry about trying to save a little bit of wood. Put the wood right to the other side of the hole because you know the blade is going to be on the left side of your corner. It takes a lot of energy to cut wood like that because you're cutting through the plywood at the same time you're all the way through. So there we go, a little smoke. <laughs> all right. We are good. I'm gonna throw the next couple pieces in and then we're gonna glue and nail down our transition. And I'm gonna show you how to start the next room because that's the most important part of this whole project. Now, I need to re-glue here. Okay. Loving that. So I'm gently tapping while I'm pulling, keeping that line nice and tight. And we'll get one more in here just to make sure we got a nice straight line. Okay. All right, so then this is just adhesive, right? It's still 
flexible. I'm going to open this up a little bit here. I want to make sure I bond this piece of wood to this piece of wood. So I want to actually throw the adhesive right on this line. And I want to set this wood in just shy. Press towards this. It'll connect the bottom of those two boards without risking the adhesive squeezing up through the top. 16 gauge. We don't have a choice. I have tongue and groove here. This is holding everything down. Nothing's holding this down. So you're just checking to see, is it sitting in the glue flush? If it's a raised surface at all, you know, you could always throw another nail in it. But if it's not raised, then don't throw a nail in it. Just let the glue do the job. Son of a gun. Really? What the hell is going on with my nailer? I have a nail jam. That's exactly what's going on. All right, well, these things do happen. It's not the tool, it's not the nail, it's just life. Okay, the only thing you can do about this mess is take out the battery and get rid of the problem. And that's the one that's actually jammed there, eh? Look at that. Oh yeah. Come on, honey. Wow, that's really, there we go. Okay. Okay. One more time, honey, what do you say? I just don't know what to say. <laughs> Did I do something wrong? I know what it is. It's okay. We're going to be all right. Somebody reloaded the gun for me. <clears throat> and they use 18 gauge nails instead of 16. This is a really good demonstration as to why you need some reader packages. That is really in there too, that's just, that really sucks. Here we go, let's get these out of here. And that's why this is just not working with the 18s at all. 16 gauge nailer, so convenient, 16 gauge nails. <laughs> uh, or a half an hour of fussing around with your tool and damage flooring, loving it, okay. Well, here we are. Not gonna work, is it, with the darn... Yeah, there we go. Okay, I think what we're gonna realize here is that oh, I would love to be able to save this great big piece of wood. I'm gonna be chewing at the pieces, trying to save this thing. So, uh, out of the glue, off the floor, straight into the garbage and out of my house. Now we get to cut the tongue off of this one again. <laughs> patience, patience, patience. Don't want to kill anybody today. Some of you are going to comment, oh, this is great because this is the kind of stuff that happens to me and now I know what to do. That's just, okay, if it makes you feel better, then I'm glad it happened to me too. But trust me, this is frustrating. The rule of life is this though. When you want something done perfect, <clears throat> doesn't mean your goal is to make sure you don't make a mistake. Perfect is a result of making sure that if you're not happy with something, you go take it apart and you fix it. And you don't move forward until you're happy. Now, my 16 gauge still needs to be fixed. I don't know where the Allen keys are, but let's go back to our problem, which is this little hump here, using the 18 gauge nailer. Yep, still works. <laughs> okay, you don't have to have the 16 gauge nailer to do this job. If you only own an 18, you're okay. I just prefer the 16. I just find it a little bit tougher. Now, let's get this in here measured and cut. I probably should get this cut a little bit closer first. I've got this nailed a little bit established in glue. I've got this joint, I'm putting weight on it, on the corner over here. That's my straight line. Now, when you're measuring, you can set the back corner of your wood on the groove, okay? That'll establish, you can't measure like this because you're leaving a gap. So put it on the groove, and I just gotta make a minor adjustment right here, okay? And then I'm gonna come to here, same thing, put the groove on the edge. That'll actually be where it stops, and then I can come over here. A little bit of a jigsaw cut. So now I've got this piece. This is actually gonna go work. Perfect, I've cut it for this, and I'm gonna have to get it on the ground and kind of manipulate it nice and tight here, and then hammer that in. Now you can see what I'm talking about. 
That's a much better look, eh? Now, because all this is tight, I can use staples on the face of this one to put this together. I just realized I didn't staple this one yet. Oh, look what happened. One more time, we get to learn something. Of course, it's right where I'm going. Here's my next trick. This is one of the most precarious situations you're gonna run into. You hit the plunger too weak, okay? Or somebody unplugged your air compressor. And now your staple is raised up, which means it's gonna force a gap. I can't close it, all right? So I'm gonna locate where that's gonna happen. It's the last inch of this board. This is softwood plywood. So just take your knife and thin the top side of the groove. One little location like this is not gonna make a difference to the installation of the floor. All right, now we're good to go. Okay, so busy, I better make sure I got nails. <laughs> All right, I had to get that piece in because I was told you I was gonna show you the transition into the room. Here it is. Yes, we're gonna put a second piece all the way across. That won't be an issue. Here we go. Situations like this, because of the tongue groove, you wanna start going into this room right here at the transition. I have a tongue on this wood. I have to start with the groove. I don't wanna start in the middle because we, right, we nail through the tongue. We have to start right over here. And that's the first piece of flooring. Okay, and the same rule applies to having no gap. We're making sure we're perfectly square. This first board, I'm gonna, again, put an adhesive, some surface screws, just in a couple locations. And we're going to start from here, going in that direction and finish the room. And then on the other side, I'll show you this later in the video, but we're gonna get a piece of spline, is what it's called. And anywhere that sells hardwood is gonna have a tongue twice as wide as this that you can stick in a groove, and then you can go back to back, groove to groove. So what you do is you set up a point right here, where you got tongues going in both directions, and you can do like we did when we started. Do a nail strip and glue strip right down the middle of the room. Get your laser line out. Make sure you stay square. Measure off three, four, five if you need to. Let that sit overnight, and then the next day, poof, off you are to the races, okay? You can work in both different directions. No one will ever know. <laughs> you can't tell that when the floor is finished. It's a great hack. Works perfect every time. And if you set these corners in adhesive, so all you got is slip tongue, there's no nails here. Set this in adhesive. All right, and nails on the outside, boom. A couple of surface nails to keep it from having a hump. You're good to go. And that's all you need to do to transition. And then you can do nicer work than most hardwood flooring installers out there because a lot of them will cheat. They aren't gonna take time in a doorway to do this. They're gonna start on a long wall. They're gonna come by and they're gonna try to use putty or wax and goop to fill it all up. And it's gonna irritate you. So you can do a better job than almost every hardwood floor installed in North America by doing it the right way. All right, so here in the theater room, we're gonna make our transition into this room. Now, I talked earlier about why we were gonna start here and how we're gonna do it. Now, I'm gonna show you. Here's your tongue and groove, all right? Here's your tongue and groove with a spline attached. Now it's tongue and tongue. My son aptly calls this the French kiss carpentry technique. I coined a phrase, I might as well give him credit for it. Here we go. And it's just a matter of buying these at the Home Depot. Just go to the flooring section where they're selling the hardwood. They usually have a bundle and they've got little stickers wrapped on the end. I just chopped them off and they sit inside this groove aggressively in most cases. All right, this is not gonna be an easy fit. Pretty sure these are designed for the manufacturing brand that they're selling. It's close enough I can hammer it in. Before you get too excited and install it, I'm gonna suggest you get another piece and do a quick test to make sure that the gap will close. Otherwise, you might find yourself in need of a sander and a 50 grit just to clean down the line a little bit. All right? Well, it's not gonna work that way, is it? Here we go. So you can see, it actually is gonna close. All right, it looks like we're gonna have a bit of a fight on our hands getting that in. I have a trick for you. Because we're dealing with hardwood, it's gonna be a little bit of a pain. We're gonna just take the tip of our knife and we're gonna run the edge of that rectangle and trim off the corner just to make sure that it sits in that other piece of wood a little bit easier. This takes a little minute to set up. And you might think, hey, that's a lot of work. What are you doing that for? You just set it in the glue. And you can, but you know, installing flooring like this, this is about precision, not speed. And just setting things in glue with, with brad nails can be a little bit lazy. Consider this. I'm gonna be doing 
20 feet long into this room, right at the doorway. And if I don't have this go in really nice, and there's a, just a little bit of a gap opened up, it'll be the most obvious mistake we make on the entire floor. I'm gonna run just a little bit of an edge on the other side. Just to avoid that damage from happening during the install. Once this is glued down, this is gonna be really hard to do, so best to get ahead of the curve. Let's see if that installs a little bit easier now. Oh yeah, oh yeah, that's gonna go just really good. Beautiful. I think if I do this before I put all of these boards in, it's gonna take me about 15 or 20 minutes. That 15 or 20 minutes is gonna be the difference between a perfect looking job or something that people are gonna say, oh, you did this, instead of, whoa, you did this? All right. All right, so now we got all of our wood set up. Um, here's the basics of the plan. I forgot my triangle. Okay, I'm gonna just do a little bit of geometry for us, okay? And we're gonna pretend that this is the room. And in a perfect world, this side is parallel to this side. This wall here that comes on an angle where the door is, is parallel to this side. But the world isn't perfect. These three are exterior foundation poured walls. And I'll guarantee you they're not square. I'm not even gonna bother measuring. That's like saying if you jump up, you will come back down. It's the law of gravity. This is the law of construction. Poured concrete walls are never square. Just forget it, all right? What we have left is right here. This needs to be square. And that's it. As long as this is square, boom, square. I'm happy. I don't care how it finishes. I'm just gonna start with what's visually appealing. And for me, that is right here, off the edge, okay? Looking for square. And I'm gonna confirm that using a laser level. So I can manage that line for a long, 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 long time. I'm gonna come across here, make sure I've got a green line on my tongue, all across the transition. And I'm going to run this tongue off of that line as well, so I can see it on the tongue. Simply pivoting over here until that green light is right on the tongue. That's where that's going. Today, I'm gonna to install that line all the way to the other end of the room. I'm gonna embed it in adhesive. Okay, we're gonna use our thumbs here. Adjust that. Double check for square. Perfect. Love it. And now, I'm gonna surface nail. One more thing, part of this plan, instead of making you watch me do the entire room, this is a product that's available off the shelf at the Home Depot. Now, if you go to some stores where the flooring trades or the cabinet trades people go, we have a store up here in Ottawa. A Couple of different options for us. And I think that's gonna work well. This is all we do. We just wanna get that hot and melty, okay? And then rub that into the hole. Take a rag, wipe off the excess. That entire drip here is excess. Now, here's the magic. Buff it out. Good luck ever finding that again. This thing is like 10 bucks. $10 takes you from a rookie to a pro just by filling in your holes and buffing them out. This is the best way to get a professional looking result. And now you've got all the tools you need to be a hardwood pro. I'm gonna finish installing the rest of this, let it sit overnight again, and then I'm gonna be able to build in both directions. The last thing you need to know is how to finish up against the wall. So I saved a piece of that in the other room. I'm gonna show you that right now. All right, so this is the last row that you can do on your floor. It is three rows out. You still need to swing a hammer and you want to try not to damage your walls, it's just going to increase the scope of work. So if you get down on your knees and you hold this nice and flash, instead of swinging at it, turn your arm and come straight down on the corner like that. So you're going to want to be holding it nice and firm in place and hit it a little bit harder than you were before to direct enough energy to fire the staple in, like this. That way, you're not destroying your walls. I can't even tell you how many times I've seen in a home where the hardwood guys come in and there's a whole roll of hammer marks and in, in, in holes in the wall that need to be repaired after the fact. That's just lazy and it's unacceptable. <laughs> so the million dollar question is, how do we finish from here, right? Truth is, we could just cover this all in adhesive and set the wood and forget it, but we do want to get a few nails in here, okay? So 
If you've ever seen HGTV in the south, you'll see that people that have got slab on grade concrete, right, what do they do? They actually trowel adhesive over the entire surface of the floor and set the wood in it. So that's how we know it's perfectly acceptable to do this. Okay. The S pattern is so that I can find clean spots to remember to hit this wood and tap it in place. To make things go a little bit faster, you don't need to put in a nail in every board. You just want to set it in the glue and get it tapped in. Here we are. Here's another option here for you. You can't swing a hammer. Just give it a bunch of love taps. All right. Here's how we traditionally install the wood, right? Tongue, tongue. And when you want to measure and mark, don't bother with the tape measure. Spin it around, push it against the wall, and then mark exactly where this lead edge is. Okay, looking straight down on it. Then when I cut this, I turn it around and I install the tongue and that gives me a quarter inch gap on the other side. It's perfect, it's fast. And if you're building three or four rows at a time, you can do three or four cuts and mark them all at the same time. Less trips to the saw means more time on the nailer and that speeds the job up. Oh, we're looking good here now. Now, unfortunately, most people in the professional trades, they're out there doing the flooring. You're gonna see two or three different qualities of work here. Some guys will just fill the last three rows and then surface nail the last row. Some guys will fill the last couple rows and then glue and screw, or glue and nail the last row. And some guys, they're just gonna add the glue and just put in the wood and not surface nail anything. A lot of it has to do with what kind of finish you have. In a pre-finished wood like this, that's not shiny and not glossy, it's more rustic. Surface nails are perfectly acceptable. If you've got a wood that has a perfectly glass-like appearance, surface nails are really hard to cover up. So consider that and consider your baseboard options. In this house, we're using a half inch baseboard, so there's almost no mercy. Surface nails are almost necessary. If we were gonna go with a glossy like finished floor, I would request a three quarter inch baseboard just so I had room for surface nails that could be covered. Alrighty, we get this bad boy measured and cut, and then we'll show the last row. Now we're gonna just do the last row. And this is, we get a lot of requests for this. I think I've done flooring installs before, I never showed anybody. Here we go, no measuring required, okay. Just go like this, make a mark on the floor. Turn it around, because this is the piece of wood that's gonna go here. And if you wanna know how thick it should be, you just put it against the wall, okay? And then you mark the surface. And then the same with the other side. Now, see this? Wait a minute, Jeff, that doesn't work. You got the wrong measurement, right? Exactly. You're supposed to measure here, in case your wall isn't straight. Measure here, and then measure here, standing up. Now we have the right cut at the right location. So when I've cut off this tongue, Got it perfect. I'm gonna show you the wrong way and then the right way, okay? This is it'll help you out. And I'll explain it by doing it wrong first, and then you'll understand the reason why. So here we go. We've got two dots on the board. I'm just gonna connect the dots with another piece of wood. There's no sense using the fence, because that would require all your cuts to be exactly the same. And remember the rule, they don't make walls square, so don't even bother wasting your time checking. Now, in this particular case, let's see if this is working. This particular saw, the blade comes towards you. It's like a chop saw, and then it's spinning in the same direction, but it's throwing things at your face as it cuts. All right, so be smart. Here we go. That is time for a new saw blade. <laughs> now the right way. Take your lever out, and we're gonna take this saw and turn it to 30 degrees, and then tighten her up. Now we're gonna lock that in place. Now we've gotta cut the other side now. Remember, this is the finish, this is the wall, and I need an angle. I want my angle like this across the board. That's the last one of those cuts we do today. <laughs> now, when I'm making my measurement up against a wall, I'm also taking off a quarter inch, which is perfect because I have half inch baseboard. And I know the wall is relatively straight. I'm trying to give you a tip here because as a homeowner, if you've never done this before, 
A lot of people have a tendency to try to do what I would call exact finish carpentry on everything they do, even drywall. So they'll cut and measure everything perfect. But look at this. When I lay this here and I try to roll it over, three quarter inch lumber, if you cut it too perfect, it doesn't have enough room to roll over. When you cut an angle on it, you can roll it and fit it down no problem. So putting that 30 degree angle is perfect for you. It gives you time and space. Now, if you wanna cut your material and you wanna scribe it and you wanna make sure you have a perfect quarter inch and, and you don't put the angle on, that's fine too. With a good blade, <laughs> you'd notice that they cut both quite easily and it's worth the effort to put a bit of an angle on it to make your life easy. Now, here we are going with adhesive again. And remember, really wanna make sure everything's pulled nice and tight here. This is a great place for a red bar now. Okay. There we are. Red bar going, and then you close this way. It shouldn't take any more force than what the drywall can re resist with you, okay? Couple of options. Surface nails. All right, or you can just take shims. Let's start with something with a little bit of meat. There we go. And you can just compress that and make sure that that's causing compression through all three rows. That's why I like that better than a nailer, because I like to have that compression on all three rows, not just a nail holding the last one. Here we are. Let's get that in there. Now, here we are. Make sure you get the glue in one more time. For best results, compression is the key. Then add a nail. And then you just go get your little wax and your lighter. Do some touch-ups before you walk away because you're going to forget to do it. <laughs> Guarantee you. Oh, well, here we go. This is getting a little tighter over here. Here. Oh, that's perfect. Force it in. If I have to force it in, that means it's tight. All right. So when you're doing a rip, we've got three different pieces of wood. Here's my system. I'm gonna measure, instead of to the surface, I'm gonna to measure to the edge of the tongue. I measure from here to the edge of the tongue because there's a little more space to maneuver. I'll throw it on the wall. Now here's the joint. I need this measurement too. That was very consistent. Okay, and here's the joint. And, yep, very consistent still. It's a little bit tighter. And then down in the corner, it's gonna be tighter, of course. Three and three quarter. All right, so now, I'm gonna be measuring. This board is gonna be a four inch from here. So I can set my guard. This one is gonna be four. Going a little bit skinnier, three and seven eighths. And then I'll use a straight edge to connect the dots. And this one I'm gonna cut. Okay. All right, now. I'm gonna put these two together and line up this corner. And now I'm gonna measure Mark reversed, I'm gonna cut this. And now I can do my last measurement, three and seven eighths to three and three quarters. Get a piece of wood here, do a straight edge. Here we go. Now, I'll run all these through the table saw and then stick them all in. First rule is I have to cut an angle so that I have a little extra room when I'm dropping them in so I'm not being frustrated with the depth of the wall. Now in order to do a rip that's all the same depth, I'm gonna start this, I'm gonna get my blade in and then I'm gonna bring the fence over to the wood. Here we go. You can't use this measuring guide as soon as you put a blade on an angle because it's changed its position. So you just get your cut going, slide it in on there. Okay, bring over the fence so that everything is working together nice and smooth. Then we'll just run it through. Now, for best results, only put the adhesive for this piece of wood at a time so that you don't have excess, you don't get it transferred on your other tools. There we go. Now, this is a brand new tube. It's gonna keep running for a little while, okay? Find us somewhere to set it. Remember, always have your solvent on hand just in case. I know I've talked about this before, but I'm not joking when I say that that can't be cleaned after the fact. 
right here where the screw is, that's the best place to put a shim. Okay. If you need to get a little bit more tension on your board, having problems with some of that residual glue in there from before. Okay. Whatever it takes to make that perfect, you got to do it. Unfortunately, this is the next day and there's a bit of adhesive from this row that was sneaking underneath the tongue and groove. So I really had to force it in there. Holy cow. A couple of surface nails to help. Let's take a look at this. There's all the goo that oozed out after the fact. I'm not joking about being very careful with managing this stuff. Here we go. And that'll do that again. There we are. Okay. It's not under tension, we can just throw nails only. Okay, last piece. This entire floor is done. Man, that is a good feeling. So I've got my door jam set up here on my table. And I'm gonna be measuring the outside dimension. Our measurement was 80 and a half for the holes. So we're gonna go 80 and a quarter. We're just gonna make a mark on each side. The hole for the door here is also a crucial element. We're gonna make sure that this space here is relatively level. There is a slightest slope. So the hinge side is just a little bit taller. Now we're gonna take this 80 and a quarter and we're gonna take it back just a hair. Gonna take back another eighth. Because the floor is on a slope, we're gonna cut this one a little bit shorter. That way the finished jam will sit on the floor on each side, all right? To cut this, we're gonna use our triangle to create a inverted table saw here. And so there's my spot. I'm gonna pinch that. In order to get this going, I've gotta pull the safety because I'm using it upside down backwards. Okay. There we go. And then the same was over here, only this one. <laughs> I've gotta go the backwards. I'm just lining up where my saw blade touches my pencil. When I do this, I'm only focusing on the square and this blade. I'm not looking at what I'm cutting. There we go. All right, now, very important when you're working with your doors, you've established the swing. Here we are. That fits really nicely. All right, now that's not going anywhere. One more measurement you want to get, the height of the door, which is different. I'm going to measure from the hinge side of the floor, which was the high point, to the underside of that jam, which is 79 and a half. I know there's going to be an eighth of an inch gap because the door is always a little smaller on top. And I want to have a gap on the bottom. And I don't want the gap to be too little because that's just asking for trouble. So we're going to go to 79 and an eighth. That'll give us a quarter on the bottom and an eighth on top. The key to doing things right is writing it down. There we go. We got our number. Let's pull out our door and I'll show you what I'm working with. Now, there's a chance this is in the way. I'm just going to get rid of this. This is part of the packaging to keep the door from opening up during transport. Here we go. Here we are. Okay, so what I'm going to do is take a straight edge and I'm going to connect the dots. Now, if you want, you can set up a track saw or you can... Do whatever you want to do to keep that straight line. I could set up the level and clamp it down to create a fence to run the saw against, but it's not that, that necessary. Here we go. Now again, that's my cutting surface. So from that metal is where the blade touches. Now I've set up my saw. This section here, and that will be stay wood. This black mark actually marks out what the teeth of the saw blade are removing from the surface. So that's the height of the finish that I want. When I'm done my cut, in a perfect world, I should see just a hairline of that pencil. Okay. I'm gonna start off with a square, and then I'm gonna finish off just by following my line. Once I'm buried in here, eight to 10 inches, if I keep this on the pencil, and this and this bend of the blade are both up against wood, it creates a straight line for me. So all I gotta do is push, and we'll finish off with the square. There, that was that simple. Now, because we're finishing this door with a stain, I had to remove any of those pencil marks or rubbing my lines. That's great. We just softened up the edge with the palm sander. Now we're ready to put this all back together. The challenge here is we want to have the door attached to the jam when we install it, because it makes things a lot simpler. Now I'm reinstalling the hinges. 
Not perfectly tight though, because we will be removing the door later, finish off the stain. But in order to install this door properly, we want to have this set up. So now I've got a nice perfect gap up there, a great gap at the bottom. The last step for an easy install is this. We're going to take this measurement at an eighth and then an eighth. Now we're going to take our material. This is our, our casing. It's just square stock. Modern look, it's just square stock. There's no detail, all right? So what we're going to do is we're going to take this measurement from the pencil line to the pencil line, which gives us a surface here that material is up against. I can actually cock that gap. That's important because it makes everything look pretty. So we take our actual measurement of that space, which is actually 29 and a half. Did I read that right? 28 and a half. Wow, that could have been dangerous. 28 and a half. I'm going to write this down. Okay. Plus the width of the casing, two and three quarters, twice. There's five and a half. Plus, I want to have a one-inch overhang on the top on each side. I'll show you what I'm doing in a second. But, 35, 36. Okay, now we're going to go to the saw. We're going to cut the header, because with the header cut, it makes this install really, really easy. And just as a tip for you here, when you're looking at your saw, take a look at where your blade makes contact with the saw. It's pretty much in the middle here. This material is really thin. So if you're measuring and make a mark up here, it's really hard to line up where exactly your blade's going to touch, because it's... <laughs> All right. In this scenario, we want 36 inches. So we're going to mark the lead edge of the material at 36. And then we're going to slide this across so our, our blade can actually make contact. And we can actually see where the tooth is going to cut. And that's how you get precision. All right. You hold it firm. You release the safety. Get the blade spinning and then go through the material. The amount of times I see a guy and they'll just be chopping through that, which is why we cut out the chop saw, because the blade isn't even spinning when it hits the material. It's really hard on the tool, okay? Now, what we want to do here, because this is a modern look, we're going to just do a little bit of a detail. Now, this material is two and three quarters. That is the same as one and three eighths. That's the halfway mark. One and three eighths, right here. We're going to throw a 45. Two and three quarters to cut that in half. You just make that one, and you make this, and you just double the bottom. Double the denominator, all right, and you're fine. Three-eighths. That's how easy math is. Now we're going to bring this across, and I'm going to switch hands because I don't want to go cross-hand. All right, I want to make that blade make contact right where the material is. Same with the other side. Now I have a header. So we're going to do this now. Take the same eighth. I'm going to use my finger as a stopper, and I'm going to just put my mark on each side. Now remember this measurement? This measurement plus casing plus an inch to get us our detail that we like means that I measure back with two and three quarter for the trim plus an inch is three and three quarter. I make my mark. Now this is where I'm going to set it. On that pencil line, this mark lining up with this one. Make sure you're looking straight at it, not on an angle, because that'll lie. If I'm standing on an angle, that looks like it's lined up, but the camera will show you that I'm wrong, right? So make sure that you get in front of your thing that you're measuring every single time. That's the location that we're going to want to nail that. When you're working with door jamps and you're adding casing, anywhere you're adding the casing on the door jamps, especially with MDF, you want to use a thicker nail, okay? You want to use the 16 gauge. 18 gauge is great for wood, but for this kind of material, the heavier gauge makes it stick better. And you want to use short nails. Inch and a quarter is plenty here. All right, here we go. Done. That was a little too close to the edge there for my own comfort. Okay. Okay. Now I'm going to show you two different ways to case this. You can nail this in advance, which makes the door installation easy, or you can use an adhesive and nail it after just in the two corners, and that makes your repairs and your painting easier. So you got to pick which poison you like or which difficulty you have. If you're a lousy painter, using adhesive and trimming it up might be better, but if you're lousy at carpentry, <laughs> then doing this to install your door might make your life a little easier. Here's why. Now I take my door, I'm setting it in position, And all I have to worry about is making sure the, the front is flush. And it holds it right where I want it. Nice and simple, okay? So one person installation. Now, remember we took a level to this earlier. We were looking at it earlier is the side level. So we can do this. Because we only have a half an inch gap, we can do all the filler on one side. If the wall is level, and it's not perfect, the top is in a little bit. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna screw in the top and then we're gonna shim to the bottom. So if it's like this, you start at the top and then you shim out the bottom to get it perfectly level. One of the ways you know that it's leaning right now, watch the door. It wants to close all by itself. Okay, that's a way, good indicator. 
I'm going to take my pencil now. I'm just going to mark right on, this is the doorstop. It usually comes delivered with just a couple of pin nails. What I want to do is I want to make sure that I'm attaching this after the fact, after the install. That's why it's only on two little nails. It's not finished. It's just set there so they don't lose it during shipping. You want to take that off to install your door. Make sure you have a pair of pliers with you. Remove those nails by rolling it against the material, preferably right where that piece of wood is going to go back. That way if you make any damage or dents, you don't have to fill them. You're going to cover them. Now, we want to use construction screws here. Remember I said that this is inside, so we're going to start up here between the hinge and that pencil mark. This is holding me flush. So it's not going to get any more perfect than that. And that's my start. Now I can check to see I have a nice gap from here to here, so that's no concern. What I do have to worry about now is getting this perfect. You can see I can move this back and forth, no problem, right? And it's sitting right on the ground. And I can take shims and a hand level and I can go back and forth all day long until I find the sweet spot. Or I can just pull out my laser, stick it on the ground, as square as roughly you can go, and put it on that pencil line up there. That's one eighth. All I've got to do is tap the bottom of this till I have a one eighth gap. If I can reach in behind with a full shim, if not, then come from the front, okay? It really all depends on how straight the framing is. A lot of times the framing is twisted, so you can come at it from both sides if you want to. This one's got a bit of a twist, so I'm gonna shim right here. And a little bit of resistance there is because the screw caused a bump on the MDF on the backside. So I don't mind if it's a little bit out. What I want to do is make sure that the face of my jam is also plumb. All right, that's good. You see it might push this out just a little bit because when I add my screw, again, I'm between the hinge and my pencil line, so it'll be hidden. Nice and flush. Oh, this actually twisted out. Hang on a second. We'll try that again. There we go. Now I'm on my 1 8th again. Now there's two ways to cut off extra shims. You can snap and score it and snap it. Or if you have a whole bunch, you can use a multi-tool. Now, depending on the gap here, this might work out really well for me. Okay, there we are. <laughs> All right, now, all we have to do is do the same to this side, but we want to use the door that's hanging off the hinges to set the depth. This is the best system. Now, the degree that you want perfection, you can fiddle with this all day long. But the biggest issue is when this material is on and the door is closed, is there a gap? Because this is a privacy issue. As long as there's no gap, then we're fine. Try to keep this edge as straight as possible so your next material will go on looking good. But like I said, because of that one eighth that we set this back in the caulking line that you're gonna do a concave, a little bit of variance is not the end of the world, okay? Now, let's just trim all this off and we'll show you the casing. I use this tool this time instead of the knife because when it's really thick, you usually have to do a few passes with the knife. That's how I have this scar right here. I was cutting and then I put the knife in my hand and then I grabbed the shim. Something happened and the knife passed through my thumb, opened it right up. It was really not a good day. Next. We gotta get these things back on. We're switching over to the 18 gauge now. And I love this. These Craftsman tools are awesome, the V20. I remember growing up in the trades, the only automatic nailers we had were pass load and we had to have gas and battery. They seemed like a convenient tool at the time. But that's only because we didn't have a better option. Nowadays, DIY line of tools is far superior anything the trades had even 10 years ago, which means if you're gonna do your own renovations on your own house today, you're working with better materials at an entry level price point than what the craftsmen and artisans were using just a few years ago. So if you're not happy with your work, don't blame your tools. Probably because you didn't watch enough of my videos. <laughs> my custom doors here are an inch and three quarters thick. So I'm just gonna mark them with my line here at inch three quarters plus a hair, throw in a pencil line, bring this over. There you go. Now that sets that. And then I can just adjust this so it gets a nice contact. If you're working with somebody, they can hold the door closed for you. But if you're not, that's how to do it on your own. Ah, we got a door installed. Next thing is the casing. Now we're gonna measure from the floor right up to that lead edge. And we're gonna be as precise as we can. 79 and a half, 79 and 5 eighths, and a bit. That's called measuring. 79, 5 eighths, and a bit. Let's cut that one down. Now when you cut something perfect, it won't fit. 
Now that's perfect. We're going to use a two inch nail on the outside of this material to contact with the stud. So jam and then stud. Yep. When you're putting on your casing, you can't just rely on nails on the outside. You've got to put some into the jam itself. So what you want to do is use the inch and a quarter up against the jam piece. You just need a few. That'll make sure that the caulking doesn't get separated over time. When the door's opening and closing, if things cause some twisting motion, that'll save your bacon. Make your life easier while you're finishing. Throw the nails next to each other. All right, and then one closer to the bottom, but not right at the bottom, because remember, we always want to use casing that's pre-painted. That keeps the brush away from that wood when we're finishing. Now, it's time for baseboards. So we're going to show you two different ways to install baseboards on your trim and how to do the outside corners, because those are key. I got a trick for you I haven't shown you yet. So we're going to jump into all that, and we're just going to rearrange all of our equipment to a different part of the room. So, quick little story. I'm at the hardware store today, and I was going to pick up the liquid no-nail stuff, right? Because it works nice. The one I was at, they didn't have the regular. They had the extra duty. But it was 16 bucks for the two. So I'm like, I'm going to use this. Eight bucks. Two in one seal and bond. Here's the plan. We're going to install this one with only two nails. We're not going to put the adhesive along the bottom, just along the top. Okay? And I'm going to use the 18 to put this on. So again, I've got my mark two and three quarters plus the extra inch overhang. I'm gonna get that lined up on my location. Bam, bam, installed. The only thing left to do now is after I stain the doors, I'm gonna put a bead of caulking on this. And I can press that in. It's gonna make great contact with the drywall surface and I'm good to go. That's if you're not comfortable. Let's just face it, not everybody's gonna have a brad nailer. Maybe you gotta you do a hammer and nails. That's a great technique for you. But for me, I like to grab an inch and a quarter into the jam. I just always like the fact that it's not going to be moving independently. I'm going to throw a couple casings on and then we're going to jump in. We're going to show you the baseboard technique, why it's so simple and makes your life easy. And then we're going to do an inside 45 and we're going to do an outside 45 and show you a couple of different miter joint tricks because we don't have to miter the casings. But if you're going to trim out a room, you're going to need a miter joint sooner or later, unless your room is literally just four walls with no outside corners. That would be awesome. Here's our corner. It's a 45. The trick to getting something close to perfect, and it's impossible because of the mud and the joint, you want the backside of that joint in the groove. That's what you want to measure to. Now, had I gone to 46, maybe it'd be perfect, but I don't give a rip because I'm going to be caulking the joint. Finished carpentry at this level, 95% of everybody that lives in North America is not about perfection. It's about getting it close. Once you're close, you're as close to perfect as you need to be. So if you take a 45 on the back side of both pieces and you just overlap them in the corner, that's all you need. The wall is going to have bends, curves, twists. You can't try to make all of your measurements based on that. Set it nice and easy. There's a gap. We'll fix it. I'll show you in a second. But now that I've got that in location, I want to come over to the other end of this. We're just going to go like this and set the pencil mark. Now oh, there's my cut for that side. We'll go to the other side and come over here and make this measurement. Now that's an exact length, but it's also on an open angle. So in this case, I'm going to put it on the saw standing up and I'm going to cut the pencil line as well because the pencil represents the end of the board, but if I take off that little 30 second of an inch, then it'll fit into the gap. So let me just show you what I mean. We'll cut both of these and stick them in. We can save ourselves a lot of nails just by using a little bit of adhesive. Okay. I mean, we'll throw one in just for the hell of it, just to help close this gap over here. I'm assuming that there's going to be wood coming off that electro box. Yep, there was. Now let's check this one out and see how that's closing. All right. Now here's how you make a perfect miter joint. Okay. That's it. So we're going to finish nailing this on in just a second, but I got a couple more tricks to show you. We're cutting this. We're going to cut it on a bit of a 45 degree angle, and we're going to start with a small hole. And if we need to, we can always make this hole bigger when we get to it, but I'm going to show you a couple tricks for finishing this off. I to engage. Now, you'll notice this part of the baseboard is sitting a little bit flush. Nice over here. Okay. And to be honest with you, we don't even know if those nails are going in anything because I've got green board for soundproofing and then drywall. So if you're using that situation, you don't know if you have contact, put the nails in on angles so that it's creating a pinch and that'll keep the board in place. Now over here, I'm off the ground, but because it's MDF, it has a little bit of flexibility. So I'm going to shoot down here and up here. 
couple of times, then it'll help give it some resistance, and that should hold it in place. And now we have enough time here for the adhesive on the backside to do its job. As far as caulking is concerned, we have a nice small gap here. We have a small tip. We're gonna set the caulking on there. First, we'll get it flowing nice, here we go. We're gonna squeeze as we pull, and it leaves a perfect concave line. There isn't even any need to put your finger in that, okay? Slow down while you're recharging the gun. Squeeze again. Now, if you make any issues like this, quick lick and a wipe. Off you go. Now, as far as over here is concerned, this is the kind of stuff that everybody wants to know. What I'm doing is I'm using my finger to hold the tube away from the edge. So I'm overfilling that gap. Okay, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come back with a tool. And this tool doesn't have a sharp edge. It has a concave corner on it. And I'm gonna just snow plow and force that material into that gap and leave a perfect concave. Wipe the finger, soften it up. As soon as you do that, you make a dent. Did you see that? Now there's a dent because I put my finger there. So you don't wanna make a dent. You gotta trust the tool to do the job. One more time. Just hold this tight and pull it. Perfect caulking line. Because I use adhesive and nails here, this is not moving. Now I can caulk this gap here pretty much in the same manner. Okay, I'm gonna use my finger here. Keep the tip away from the edge. Okay, so I have excess material. Now, I'm gonna come over here on the bottom, run it across, make a nice little 45 with my tool, and then run up the inside corner. And now I can pre place my tool here and clean that out. That's a perfect edge as well. And then I can come across the top, clean in all the imperfections and the difference in heights. And remember, when you're dealing with MDF as a baseboard, for whatever reason, they come out of the mill different thicknesses. Your corners are always gonna be atrocious. So having a tool to flatten out those adjustments is money in the bank. That really eliminates the differences. Let's just always start with a clean tip. Drag and pull, no need to clean. Here's an issue where everybody makes a mistake. Oh, they're close together, the paint will solve that. Well, expansion and contraction over time, God help us all, would it be too much to ask? Just put a little bit of caulking around your baseboard. If there's a shadow, it looks ugly. This is gonna be one of these issues that everybody has an issue with, okay? Caulking in your nail holes. If it's an 18 gauge nail hole, you can use caulking. If it's a 16, it's too big a hole for caulking, you gotta use dry decks. And as far as the tops of casing is concerned, the only time you have to do the caulking along the top is near stairwells. If it can be seen, it has to look perfect. So if it can be seen, you make it perfect. But if it can't be seen, you don't have to worry about it, right? I mean, if no one's gonna see it, who are you trying to impress? Here we go. Nice, perfect bead. <clears throat> and I use my middle finger because it's the longest one that I got. No offense, a little bit of caulking in the 18 nail hole, no problem, right? Like I said, can't do that in the 16. Let me just get you the dried X and I'll show you. In case you're not familiar. There, there we go. Yeah, that's right. They have the same technology in this as we had in our paint. And that is it goes on pink and dries white. Now we're just taking a, a little dip. Okay. And it runs smooth. Okay. And then whenever you're using this stuff, you're going to have to sand it afterwards. Okay. You just can't get away from it. Or you're going to have some sort of a mark or a bump or whatever. And that's fine. If you have a system and you know that your nails on the outside are 18s, that's great. Or if you want to get an um, inch and a half nails for an 18 inch gun and swap back and forth and back and forth, that's fine too. But you need a two inch nail out here to get through this, through the drywall into the stud. Over here, you're just trying to make contact with the jam. If you use a two inch on any kind of an angle, you run the risk of hitting a screw coming back at you or just hitting the MDF two on the edge and it'll split into out. It doesn't take much for an 18 gauge nail to get redirected. Just a little fiber in the wood from the construction process at the plant. It's really, it's not a big thing. So that's why I go with a shorter nail around my doors when I'm trying to be as perfect as possible. And if you got any damage to your wood, that's just shipping damage right there. It's okay to put more than you need because we're gonna sand anyway. And then it'll scream at you and remind you to sand. <laughs> as for the rest of this, these were done with the 18s. The reason we can use our finger to fill that with this, so small that the caulking isn't gonna shrink. These holes are too big, the caulking will shrink. And that is so small that your finger isn't gonna create a dent where the 16 gauge is big enough that your finger will create a dent. So take the time while you're doing your carpentry. Keep things perfect as you go. Okay, now we're gonna do an inside corner and an outside corner. Now, because we're going straight into these inside corners with no detail, there's no miter. 
So you just stick it in, measure and cut. Over here we got the same issue going on with the cold air return as the doors. It was set at the height with the assumption of putting vinyl right on the concrete. In this case, don't be afraid to cover it up. You can install the grill right on top of this base because there's no detail and it can go a little higher than it needs to be. All the fins are pointed down. No one's ever going to notice. It's still going to function great. Let's not worry about that. Remember when you're doing baseboards, if it fits when you put it in, it's too small. It should have just a little bit of a need for a little bit of love. And put that there, a little bend, snap it in. I'm going to start here. Okay, wood's there. We always have wood beside the cold air return. That's too easy. And on this side, I'm pushing down now. And most electrical boxes are on the right side. If it stays pulled snug like that, you know you found it. All right, in the corner where the floor dips. Okay. Because we're manipulating to follow the contour of the floor, so we don't need an extra piece of trim, you're gonna have gaps open up. Use the tool and the caulking in those situations to create a perfect intersection point. And if the gap is big enough, you might have to come back a second time. That's not the end of the world, all right? If your gap shrinks up when it dries, it was just a little bit too much material and it got small. So add some more and fill it up so that it's not noticeable. Here's my little secret to help make these outside corners a lot easier. Knock off the extra mud, first of all. You don't want to let the dried up mud dictate to you how the size of your trim is going to be. Take a scrap piece, lay it up against the wall on both sides, okay? And then measure the gap. And measure backwards, so you're measuring the outside, not the inside. In a lot of cases, because of the corners, the trim has to follow a contour. And you want to make sure that you're measuring the outside point to the outside point. That makes that seven and three quarters in this case. You notice this particular trim here was cut extra long. That's because when you're doing this sort of thing, having the trim meeting off the wall is not a problem. That can be fixed, right? That's just caulking. That solves that problem. Now, here's my secret to doing this. I'm gonna fill up the backside with enough caulking that it has to be pushed into place. And I wanna put it on the outside edge here. Remember, this is just acrylic latex, all right? It cleans up real easy. I'm gonna set it in place and just get that out of the way. Nice and gentle. Okay. Now for whatever reason, this one is sticking way out. And you know, these imperfections are gonna happen. Now, I'm trying to create a square environment, so I'm pressing this back. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna take this, my tool, up against the wall, and I'm gonna hold this in place while I put nails just off, set to it. And if it goes a little bit too deep, I'm gonna pull this back out until everything closes up nice and tight. Now, same thing applies. This is just caulking on that corner. When it dries, it might not be perfect. You might need a second coat, so pay attention to it. We're just gonna fill this gap. I'm gonna stick the, the tip right in the hole. Okay, right in there. And then I'm gonna add a little bit extra material, something that I can tool back. All right, there we go. Less is more in this situation. The caulking that we're using is a 40 year. It has the capacity to expand and contract plenty enough, especially for a basement. When you're choosing a method for your house, you gotta take into account a couple things. One, where you live, what kind of weather you get, how consistent is it? If you're in a basement, the temperature in the basement is very consistent year round. There's not as much expansion contraction as there is on a main floor. Contrary, the second floor of the house has the most. Where you work determines what material you use. If I'm gonna be working on a second floor of a house, I use uh, Dynaflex. It has like a 400% expansion contraction. It's worth the 12 bucks a tube. But when I'm working in a basement, a 40 year, $7 tube of caulking is fine. And if you're uh, not sure, get the good stuff. So we finished 1,500 square feet and it costs $18,000. That's doors, flooring, insulation, soundproofing measures, the hardware, paint, the cabinets, all of it, all right? And what that means is, as a homeowner, instead of paying $100,000 to a contractor and letting them do this over six months with all the aggravation and you managing the project for them, you can do it yourself. It took me eight weeks, 30 hours a week. You can fit this into your schedule, even if it takes you a year. It's at your own pace, and you're gonna get the kind of results you wanna get. Remember. Basements don't have the best return on investment. So if you do it yourself, you're making money. Cheers to next time.